Um, good morning, my name is Jill Remick. I am the Director of Property Evaluation and Review at the Tax Department. Uh, we oversee the implementation with the municipalities, the uh, statewide education grant list maintenance, and the statewide equalization study, which sets the um, common level of appraisal and coefficient of dispersion for um, towns for the purposes of tax rates. Uh, we also implement the current use program as it relates to property tax adjustments. Um, that program we do in partnership with the Agency of Agriculture and the Department of uh, Forest Parks and Recreation. And we also implement the tax increment financing program where uh, the downtowns that have received a TIF agreement through, um, I can't think of the agency that we're partnering with on that right now. Yeah, that's um, We work with the towns to um, ensure that they're collecting the proper amount of education tax revenue for that and help them with the um, withholding for the TIF, for the length of the TIF um, agreement. And we also um, have property tax hearing officers who are independent entities that we appoint who hear property tax appeals that go beyond the Board of Civil Authority. So if a taxpayer um, is unhappy with their property assessment, they can appeal that to the lister. Uh, they can appeal that decision to the Board of Civil Authority, and then they can either appeal to me as the director, who assigns it to a hearing officer, or they can go to the Superior Court. Um, and then from there, they can also appeal to the Supreme Court after it's gone through myself or the, uh, or the um, Superior Court. So lots of different programs, but all essentially related to working with the municipalities for the purposes of um, tax rates. So we have an annual report we've been required to do for several years. Um, it's become a bit of a um, key resource for throughout the year. I know obviously in my role I look at it frequently, um, and that's why we still continue to provide hard copies, but it is available on our website. It's on your committee website. Um, and then on our web page, we also have a deeper dive into the tables if you're interested in downloading those. Um, I also oh, so there's even more information than there is in the book? Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and I brought Jake Feldman with me from yeah. the department. Obviously, yeah. folks probably know him very well um, in case you get into some of the technical pieces that I'm not able to answer. That'd be good to have Jake in here. Um, I also had a couple other just PVR related items I wanted to bring up, but maybe I'll start by just going through the report. Would that be helpful? I think what, um, so this is a great report. I look at it. I didn't realize there was more data online than there is in here. Um, nice. Um, and I think what would be good is just getting people familiar, although we're missing one or two people, but they'll come in, um, getting people familiar with what's in here, um, yeah. just so that they know how much information they've got available. Okay. Okay. Why don't you sort of just go Sure. So um, some of the key pieces that I think are um, pretty frequently used by folks in here, um, obviously there was a table of contents, but I, I did mark ones that I wanted to make sure you folks knew about. Um, on page seven, so six and seven is sort of the statewide summary of um, education property tax rates and municipal tax rates. So um, our division is responsible for hosting the software program that collects the grand list information. So even though we don't set municipal tax rates, obviously we do collect that and then we use that information for things like property tax adjustments and for calculating the hold harmless payment for um, foregone municipal revenue um, due to the current use enrollment. So we all we track municipal tax rates as well. So on page seven, this is just sort of a good historical picture of um, education funding taxes, municipal taxes, the changes in the tax rates um, over time since 2009, and then also the effective tax rates. So what you find in this is the first several pages of the report are the sort of statewide picture, and then later in the report are county by county and then town by town. Um, figures for each of these um, different calculations that we do. So it's kind of handy to have the statewide and then and then the, um, the one specific to the municipalities later in the report. Um, also, we wanted to draw your attention on page eight to the information about the statewide common level of appraisal and just sort of what that, what that means. So our district advisors, we have a team of seven district advisors who have regions throughout the state that they're assigned to. Um, so they each have about 40 to 50 towns that are there that are their um, coverage area. So they work with the towns throughout the year to maintain the grand list, to make updates, to provide valuation assistance, especially with complex properties. And then for several months um, after April 1st, we work with them to validate sales for the purposes of setting the, um, the CLA. So they actually review every um, sale that goes through the town with the town. 
and then we do a separate review in-house so that we can ensure that we can set the proper um, equalized value. So if property tax or property values um, and the property transfer tax returns are showing us that the uh, real estate market in that town is changing, and we're capturing that in the study and adjusting the impact on the tax rate uh, within there. Um, something we've been focusing on a lot at the tax department in the past couple of years is the volatility of the CLA, because what that does is it actually has a pretty significant impact on what the actual tax rate is after it's gone through that process. And so some towns may see their um, their municipal and their education tax rate as one thing, and then once the CLA is applied, it's actually a very different figure. And obviously, um, when that CLA adjusts up or down, and that change happens, then that impacts taxpayers. Um, and we've been finding the more, and Jake has done significant you know, evaluation of this, that it definitely seems to impact smaller towns that have fewer, um, you know, fewer sales in their markets, for example. Um, and so we're trying to find ways in the study to sort of mitigate that volatility um, and also communicate with towns that are seeing that volatility and see how we can help them um, address that. Maybe it's time that they have a reappraisal. Maybe they haven't done that for a long time. Um, and there are you know, resources we can use to help them do that. Um, I'm going to just stop you for a second and explain where people are now that I figured it out. Um, there was a press conference on family leave, and I, I, Robin told me she was fine, but I'm looking at the people who are listening. Oh, I'm guessing Joey's that's there. where the yeah, others are. Joey's people. there as well. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. Sam probably, and um, anyway, and George. So my apologies to you to uh, be speaking to an empty room. <laughs> they will come in. Okay. Yeah. And I'm happy to come back anytime, obviously, if you want to dig into it. Um, so we actually, um, after the equalization study was over, it's due to folks on um, you know, the beginning of January, um, and then we issue this tax rate, that um, information out to all the school districts and, and select boards and listers and so on, um, right after Christmas is usually when that's done. Um, but we actually sent a specialized letter to about 15 towns who saw a great question. I just have one. Yeah. Um, on CLA, is, where, where can I go and see what the CLA is for each town? I think that's this year, previous is, is it actually in here? Yeah. Oh, it's in this book. But what is it? Would it would so year over year, we could pull for you pretty easily if that was something you're interested. This, this for the for these tables, these are just this. Yeah, I thought you didn't have that by chance. We have yeah, but time. maybe oh. this year. Oh, they are. Yeah, they are. Okay, never mind. Great, thank okay. you. All yeah. right. I, I was looking through here. I must have missed it. Yeah. Okay. There's just so much information. Yeah, this is a ton. This, this is a great yeah. book. Yeah. yeah. It's a book. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, wait a minute. Read this every night. What is COD again? <laughs> yeah. I saw that I have trouble keeping that COD in my head, so I have to go back and look at it. In my head. I think it's a great exercise for us, too, because, um, you know, and at this point we've been doing it so long, we, we can plug it in and review it every year, so it's been refined over the years. But yeah, I certainly, I certainly use it frequently. Um, so, yeah, so we sent a letter to about 15 towns that saw a greater than 5% change in their CLA. Um, you know, it's not an official action or anything, but just to sort of give them a heads up of what that means and offer our assistance in seeing how we can take a look at, at the impact. It was definitely largely smaller places, you know, Somerset, Sales Gore. They're small, they um, haven't yep. appraised in a long time, or yep. they, you know, yep. um, a, a large property sold for a very strange amount. Yeah, yeah. Right. Or right. value. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we just wanted to sort of try to bring that to their attention and see if we can offer some, some assistance there. There's other things we might want to try to do with the equalization study we've talked to. Um, you know, I think we've come to this committee before. You know, even things on the other end of the spectrum, if you have an unlanded mobile home that sells for a really small amount compared to what it's listed at. I mean, there's, there's yeah, and in, in a small place at one property. And certainly when we're going through the study, we try to sort of throw out those outliers and extremes when we're required to do that, but, but even so, that's still an impact. So we just we just wanted to sort of be proactive and talk to them about that and see how we could help. Um, and we'll continue to try to see what else we can do to sort of help with volatility. Um, another another factor that can play into that is utilities. So we're taking a pretty deep look at utility valuation and seeing um, if that's impacting the CLA because um, those values can change year over year depending on the calculations because they're based on income and output and other things besides just purely property value. Um, but at this point, we don't have any changes. To that's another thing yeah. that can. You know, River towns over my way, fall into because of the dams. Right. They've had a lot of right. fluctuations recently. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. So next tab. So then on page ten, um, I wanted to just draw your attention to this is another major piece that PVR so does. Can I go back to the yeah. for a second. So so 
We have statutory triggers for reappraisal, which is the, we have one on the CLA and one on the COD. Um, but the a change of 5% doesn't trigger anything other than a conversation right. with you. Not in and of itself, right? Yeah, right. And is that is that good? I mean, should it? I think so. We do have a proposal in our miscellaneous tax uh -huh. bill to also um, require a reappraisal if their um, if their sale is over one twenty percent for yeah. more than ten years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, for those, you know, that is expensive. So it's not it's not a, not right. a small thing. Right. What is COD? Coefficient of dispersion. Okay. So within the different yes, categories. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> is it plus or minus, plus or minus five percent? So the plus or minus five percent was just our arbitrary, well not arbitrary, but um, our our parameter that we said that we wanted to reach out and just really oh, okay. draw attention to that that was an outcome of the study. They get a letter that so states what it is. It's an informal, yeah. you know, non. It's not an enforcement thing. It's sort of a in case you've missed it in your study, mm -hmm. yours fluctuated by eleven percent or whatever, and that's this is what it will mean for your tax rates, and this is when you last appraised. It's, mm -hmm. And that do you think it has to do with? <coughs> yeah, and, and also an just, um, yeah. I think I think it's pretty obvious that the really small, small, small places um, yeah. suffer that more, regardless of whether they were recently. So, it's not it asked about the coefficient. Right, so um, page nine um, has sort of a good explanation of the COD, but basically within the municipality, it's making sure that the different types of categories of properties are also being assessed typically, you know, relative okay. to each other. Yeah. So on page 10 um, is a figure on the bottom, and then obviously there's a there's a table, uh, I think on our web page for sure, if it's not in the book of the breakdown by town. Um, <coughs> property Evaluation Review sends out four different major payments to the municipalities every year um, related to maintaining the grand list and for education and property tax uh, adjustments. So the current useful harmonies payment, you can see that on the bottom of page 10, um, that's the payment that goes to municipalities to um, make whole what they would have earned on their municipal tax rate income for properties that are in current use. So we track the value of properties in current use and then what the payment was that we actually um, were able to collect and then that payment goes out to municipalities. There's a deeper dive into current use that I'll get to in a little while. Uh, the pilot for state-owned buildings, so the buildings and general, general services department sets those values for state office buildings um, across the state and then we send a pilot payment to municipalities for hosting those because they're property exempt, they're tax exempt. Uh, the reappraisal and grantless maintenance payments are per parcel payments that go out from the Ed Fund um, through us to municipalities for the purposes of helping them maintain their grant list. So software, um, re paying for their list or our assessor, um, uh, you know, anything related to carrying out, maintaining the grant list and updating those properties. And if that's a percentage of the um, I believe it's by parcel. Uh, okay, there's a parcel. Yeah. I'm in a parcel. Location. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so the, the theory being they'll get this reappraisal payment every year and maybe sock it away and so when they get to the point that they have to reappraise or would like to reappraise, <laughs> they might have some some money. Um, but it sort of would cover all of it. They can do it, and, but they can do whatever they want with it. Yep. Uh, and then related to also the assistance with equalization study. So like I said, there's that period of time where uh, our district advisors actually go out to each of their towns, um, work with them to um, verify sales transactions of help to make sure that our study is really using, um, you know, arm's length of sales to sub tax rate. And so they do get a, um, a dollar per parcel payment. That's what the 334,000 is for. Yes. So in the pilot program, state parks, is that part of the pilot program? Uh, I think so, yeah. They had our pilot. Right. And that actually oh, isn't yeah. sent out through us, that's sent through a different agency. But it's the yeah. same same idea, yeah. They value the properties and, yeah. <coughs> Before we go too far away from the CLA discussion and section, I understood that you were <coughs> calculating the uh, coefficient of dispersion on uh, properties by category. Did I hear that correctly? When there are enough of when them to do When you do the so. sample, yeah. Right. If there are enough to have a good sample. Correct. But what I had understood, and this goes back to an interrogation of uh, either Chloe or Mark, 
when they were talking a bit about it, the Ed Fund and the CLA. Um, apparently, when the CLA is uh, assigned to a town, there is no weighting um, or no differentiation across towns <clears throat> when the mix between uh, residential, commercial, uh, industrial is very different. I'm thinking of towns with a large um, uh, amount of, uh, say, second homes, vacation homes, or lakefront property, um, and no industrial base. Another town, big industrial base, very um, scant uh, value in the residential uh, or commercial area. Does that, is your sense, um, when you do the samples, you still nevertheless compile the result of the samples, but there's no weighting. Um, so can, two communities that might have the same CLA, say 90 or 110, may have them for very different reasons in terms of where they fit in the taxability, the contribution to the Ed Fund, etc. And the impression I got was that we, did, we don't refine it enough to fool around trying to make similar commu communities similarly situated uh, or similarly assigned a CLA number because we don't weight the different categories of property. Do you have any? Sure. Thank you. I, I, so I'm going to try to get you up here if it's OK. OK. If you're going to testify. You can have mine. sit next to Well, I, it, it'd be. Yeah. Yeah. Great. If, if you join us at the table, oh, okay. um, I can just see, hear you better and see you better. Um, sure. And we can fit in somewhat in here. So, yeah. I, I get a chair. I can get a chair. Yeah. There's one right here. Yeah. yeah. It's that one. Okay. Oh, they do. Right? Yeah. Peter, Anthony, I'm not going to sit here. I don't think my answer is going to be too long. <laughs> Stand up and deliver yeah. it. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Jake Feldman, Senior Fiscal Analyst at the Tax Department. Um, so the first thing about the CLA, it's a general correction factor, and it applies to the tax rate, not to properties. This is indirect equalization. Um, so PB, pb r never presumes to change anyone's property value. It's just an interest, an interest of fairness for the statewide um, education fund. The tax rate is correct. So it applies, once the tax rate is corrected, that tax rate applies to all the properties in the town. Um, as far as weighting goes, there is weighting in the study. Um, what happens is, to arrive at the general correction factor, you have um, 15 different categories of property, and each one gets its own ratio to equalize it as long as the ratio is statistically acceptable. Mm -hmm. So um, a town with a lot of commercial property will have um, the, the total, the, the CLA for the town pulled in the direction of the commercial properties trend. So if the commercial property is selling for a lot more than it's listed for, then that ratio will move that commercial property category and that will feed into the eventual um, ratio for the whole town. That's Thank you. That that's very reassuring because that's it worried me. Towns are so diverse in Vermont. <clears throat> for Joe or for, for, uh, um, for Jake, come come and sit here. Is, you know, we will have to use that. Yeah. Extra chairs in the hallway have all been So my, my question: <laughs> Do we really ever see that where commercial properties go in a t significantly different direction from from your residential? Do we ever see that? For your homestead, non-homestead? I'm not sure I've been, uh, investigated that specifically. Okay. But generally, when I look at all the category ratios, they tend to move in the same direction. Yeah, that's what it's so like Burlington is hot right now. Um, property is selling for much more than it's listed for. Good. Um, and the, the <laughs> ratio. It's good for the Ed Fund. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Joey's not here. should be fainting. <laughs> I'm not far away myself. So. Yeah. Keep going, Jason. The, the CLA for Burlington actually is less than 80%. It's which, 77, yeah. Yeah, so they have to reappraise by law. Um, but when I look at their category ratios, they're all around that 80%. Mm -hmm. So it, the everything 
all categories in that town are are hot and are selling for more than they're listed for. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? Oh yes, um, COD, the, the coefficient of dispersion, is um, a good analogy is if you hunt ducks or something, you use bird shot, um, it scatters. And um, if you, <laughs> the, the shot scatters and um, you have, you could end up far away from your target. So what the COD is, is it's a measurement of the scatter in a town. For instance, in Burlington, if the CLA ends up being 80%, then you'd want basically all properties that are selling for generally being 80, around 80% of um, what their eventual sale price is. You don't want some properties for selling way more than their fair market, some way less. So that's a measure of scatter. And um, you, the scatter measurement over 20 suggests that it's, there isn't fairness, there isn't equity and fairness within the town, and that also triggers a reappraisal. Okay, so you've got so, some areas of town they're doing really well, and some areas of town they're not. Exactly. But they're all getting the same CLA adjustment. Right, okay. exactly. Okay. But I thought it was a measure of distance from the median ratio. value. Mm -hmm. It's the difference from the median ratio. So if the median ratio is. Ratio say, what? The median sales ratio for all the sales. The ratio of what? Sales Listed to assessed value? To sale price. Okay, all right. So we want them all to be close. So a lower COD number is better. Better. Okay. Yeah. But a higher CLA number is better. Close to 100. Close to 100, well, close to 100, 100 is better. Yeah. yeah. CLA is better. CLA, I know. It's just they go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Jake. Okay. Okay. Where are we? So I was just talking about the the um, municipal payments that we make to the to the municipalities each year. Um, so page 12 is just sort of a summary of another piece of a major piece of property valuation reviews work. Um, we're required by statute to provide training for listers and assessors for every town. Um, we hold trainings across the state. As I mentioned before, we have folks that are actually assigned to regions, so they pretty regularly spend time in municipal offices um, helping them with this work. So um, we hold um, several trainings and we also have a certification program. So these two pages here are just sort of summarizing um, the, the types of offerings that we have and also um, the level of the certifications that we've done. Uh, we also um, have a, a small bucket of funds, which is actually incredibly helpful, that we partner with uh, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns and with VALA, the Vermont Assessors and Listers Association. So whenever I'm in here, you'll probably also hear from VALA. Um, uh, to actually have work with them to host additional training. So VLCT has a really strong program for specifically working with boards of civil authority, select boards on um, property tax appeals, for example. And so uh, we do a partnership training with them. We do a mock appeal, um, and, and folks find that really helpful. And I think that partnership has been really good at getting more training out. They also, um, part of that contract with VLCT is they actually go to the towns that are doing a reappraisal and walk them through the pieces that they have to do for that and, um, and appeals related to that. So it's a really good partnership um, that I think has definitely helped us reach more folks than just you know, the eight of us in PDR can do. Um, and they have a whole you know, have a great set of resources for towns. Um, and then also our partnership with VALA, they host what are called the International and Assessing and International Association of Assessing Officials, IAAO, which is sort of the national um, program that listeners and assessors are part of and can get certified in. Um, I've noticed more as I'm seeing, um, you know, towns looking for listers and assessors that they want to have some level of certification for the folks that they're hiring, which is great. Um, so VALA actually hosts three of those international courses um, throughout the year, too, um, at a reduced rate, and then we can also reimburse towns to participate. So we'll reimburse the town's um, registration fee and their mileage, and, you know, in some cases, if they're having to spend the night, it's three hours away from where they are. Um, work with them to reimburse the hotel too because the whole idea is that um, listing offices in general are, are run on a pretty tiny budget and the work that they're asked to do is really complicated and so we want to do whatever we can to make sure that they get the training they need. Um, there's a lot of turnover, there's a lot of folks um, who are retiring or moving on um, and so every year we really need to try to cast the net wide and get that training out there. Um, so when our district advisors aren't carrying out the equalization study, they're the ones also hosting our trainings. 
Um, I did just want to point out on page 14, um, we are, this is I think a new page in here, or at least a little fancier than how we used to provide it to you folks. Um, if you're interested, you folks might hear now and then from constituents who have property tax appeals. So like I mentioned, they can appeal their valuation. They have a window of time to do that with their um, local lister or assessor. Um, they can appeal that decision to their board of civil authority, and then they can appeal to me if they like. So um, the, the fee for appealing to the director of PBR is a $70 filing fee, and we have hearing officers that hear those um, across the state. Um, if they were to apply to Superior Court, I think it's closer to 200 So it's meant to be a more affordable um, <coughs> avenue for, and a little less formal avenue for folks to hear their property tax yeah. appeals. That's the question. So when they get past the Board of Civil Authority, if they're not happy, do they choose you to go to you or the court? Correct. They, they have don't a choice. do you then the court? Correct. You know? So they, they, can do, they can come to the Director of PDR or Superior Court, yeah. and it's their choice. And like I was saying, that's a little less expensive to come to us. Mm -hmm. um, by a little bit, you know, 70 yeah. versus 200. Mm -hmm. If they're not happy with either the Superior Court or the PBR director decision, they can appeal to the Supreme Court. So it sort of goes like this. Um, and we would say the vast majority seem to appeal to the director. Um, I think in some cases, if you're talking about a commercial property or something like that, they might be more inclined to go to the court system. But as far as the folks that we see, it's individual property taxpayers who, who have a particular case. Sure. Um, so you, you give us at the bottom of that page 14 there, uh, you give us the results of the appeals, yeah, a number of appeals, appeals. Is there any difference in the outcomes based on where the appeal is, whether it's in court, found in court or found there with you? Oh, this is only represented the ones we see. I see. So I don't, I don't know, I don't know what the outcomes what are for the ones that go to court. We really... Like I said, I think it's a very small number, and they're probably looking hey. for commercial hey. properties. Yeah. Sorry, we don't have that represented. This is just the ones that come to us. Um, so we are always, I'll take this few seconds to make our plug for property valuation hearing officers. Um, it's really hard to retain these folks. Uh, right now they get a $120 per diem for holding the hearings, and then we, um, we do pay them an hourly rate and mileage, but it's really hard to find folks across the state who can um, hold these hearings. And so we, we have about uh, five folks now who do that statewide, which is which is good, um, but it's a lot. So um, so we're trying to find new ways to recruit folks who might be interested in serving as hearing officer, because they cannot be a state employee, they can't be an employee of the department, they have to be employed. Hmm. So if you know anyone who's looking for some <laughs> part-time property tax appeal hearings, let me know. Um, so on page 15 is just a brief summary of the, the, the statewide software program that we have. So we host uh, a program that's currently offered by NIMRIC, the New England Municipal Resource Center. So there's a few components of that. Um, the piece that we're responsible for is the grantless maintenance software and then also offering CAMA. So CAMA is the Computer Assisted Mass Appraisal Program. So uh, the vast majority of towns also use the NIMRIC Microsoft system, but there's lots of others out there and there are other towns who use um, different CAMA programs. Um, so we are, that, that uh, contract has been in place since 1995. Um, it's been renewed several times. So um, in light of changing technology and needs and feedback and hearing from the towns, we are going to be issuing an RFP um, pretty soon, hopefully in February, to, um, to see what else could be out there to carry out this work. That would obviously be a couple year process and transition, or if, um, you know, if it continued to be in Emmerich, then that would be, a, you know, that works too. Um, but we just feel like we're at a point we really need to at least see what else is out there and what we can get um, for a new program. So you'll probably be hearing about that again. I'm happy to come in and talk about that more. Um, uh, you know, we really are sort of behind the times when it comes to things like uh, digital maps, especially, you know, for current use and, um, and tax mapping. There's lots of different tools out there that match with the grand list. And I know that the data that's in the grand list is obviously used for a lot of different decisions in this building. So whatever we can do to try to um, get the most information as easily as possible would be good with minimal disruption to towns. So on page 16 and 17 is a summary of the real estate transaction taxes. So these are not implemented by PBR anymore. They were up until a couple of years ago. They're part of taxpayer services, but they're obviously pretty major informational points for you folks. And the, um, the results of the um, 
property transfer tax return are our main uh, source of data for the equalization study working with towns. So uh, this summary has the property transfer tax revenue, uh, real estate withholding, and land gains um, summaries. So we figured rather than taking those out, we'd keep those in there and have them updated for you folks just to have as a reference. Right. Yeah. Eighteen is high. Quite a bit. To what do you attribute the jump? Um, I think it's a combination of a couple of really high value properties that sold, and um, and this has moved into the online system as of in 2017. Um, so I think that's also just sort of helped with um, compliance as well. Great. Thank you. Think we actually are collecting more. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Like it. And this money goes. Let's see, so a few different places. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. You don't need it. Is nice. I know we have a little administrative pull back. That's the piece you that you have to pay attention oh, okay. to. But. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I apologize. Yep. <clears throat> and land gains, it tax. Um, it seems to not be increasing. Well, I guess it's increasing as quickly as the transfer tax. And I'm not sure if that's um, come up in this case, but I know that there are um, some considerations for changing what land gains tax and you know, how it's collected or how it's implemented. So that would be a question for our policy director, Doug Farnham. Um, okay, so on page 18 and 19 is um, a really good snapshot of statewide of the current use program. Um, so for those of you who um, haven't heard the spiel before, <laughs> so the current use program is a, um, it's a, an agreement that is designed to you know, protect Vermont's working landscapes, to provide um, you know, equity and fairness for uh, agriculture and forestry, um, for taxation, um, and to encourage you know, preserving and enhancing the natural resource, and also um, you know, help um, sort of deter parcelization of, of parcels. <coughs> as well possible. So this program is an agreement. It's not an entitlement or any sort of just automatic whatever. There are pretty rigid standards that folks have to meet in order to be enrolled in the program. And when uh, a landowner enrolls their property in current use, the state actually then, um, it, they, we establish a lien on the property that's enrolled in the program. So, um, and, and if and when they decide to develop the land or remove it from the program and remove the lien, then there is a tax called the land use change tax that is due at that point. So um, I just think it's really important to sort of reiterate that um, that this program is, is a significant commitment um, and and on, on, on the landowner's part to participate in it. And so as you can see, um, a huge portion of the state is enrolled in, in current use. There's a breakdown of what's agricultural versus forestry on page 19. Um, you know, when this started, it was it was a relatively small volume of acreage, and now it's up to um, you know 18,000 parcels and 2.5 million acres in the state are enrolled in the program. Um, so uh, that's a that we have four staff members and property valuation who administer current use. And like I mentioned before, and I think it's reiterated on page. Um, let's see. Oh, on page 21. Um, so if you're enrolled in the credit program, then your, your property tax for those acres that are enrolled are, um, are at this use value that is set by a current use advisory board. So they meet in January and set these values. Um, and so there is a difference between what your property tax liability would have been both municipally and education wise on your property tax bill. And so as part of that, the state pays out that what we call the whole harmless payment, that payment I mentioned before, where we actually calculate what the municipalities um, were not receiving for, uh, municipal revenue for um, for parcels that enrolled in for use. And so that's sent out to try to sort of make the municipalities whole for the enrollment of the program. Any questions about the well, there are a million. That's but, a dangerous we, might, we may hold them back. We may not. Uh, Cynthia, no, no, we can't go hold back. Um, so we, I see that on page um, page twenty two, you have the show. You show the respective components: the municipal tax, the um, savings, and the education tax savings, and the fifteen million for 2018, 15, five. That's actually paid 
to the towns to make up for the, the property tax revenue that they lose. And, and, and I think I'm correct in that. Right. And that's shown in the regular budget. I'm on page um, right. that's 22. Right. Yep. And then we show the education tax savings. To my knowledge, and this is my question to you, to my knowledge, that figure of 50, 45, three for 2018, this is the only place where this figure is listed. I have not found it listed anywhere else. It's not listed in tax expenditures. It's not listed in the budget. And I really question that. I think this is a tax expenditure, and it should be listed as a tax expenditure. And there's a cost to it in the foregone revenue. If it's not a tax expenditure, then it's something that should be listed in the budget somewhere. I mean, it should be listed. I don't think someone should have to find this, this document in order to find out that cost. The municipal cost is listed in the budget. So this cost needs to be listed someplace. It's not in the Education Fund Outlook. It's not in the tax expenditure report. And I'm not putting that on you. This is coming from legislative direction. But I just would solicit any comment you might have as to the appropriate way of conceiving of this um, program cost. Um, that's fair. Uh, <laughs> I would say that the difference is that we actually are statutorily required to do that hold harmless payment for the municipal revenue that's mm -hmm. not collected. And there isn't any requirement to sort of capture or account for that that other piece. But you know, we've we've been tracking it for quite a while, but it's it's revenue not collected, so it's you know, before there was an education fund, this was actually a budget item because there was an actual cost. It's a plus budget. It was a budget line item we and it was it was budget. under the budget yeah. because it had to be paid to the towns because of course all of the property tax went in the town. So not only did you make up the municipal, you had to make up the education. So the whole thing was paid to the towns. And once there's an education <coughs> fund, and this is treated as foregone revenue, there's an accounting entry, but there's no tracking of it. It's not considered a tax expenditure. It's not considered in the budget. I think it's a tax expenditure, or it's a program, and then it should be in the budget. So um, I just think it's, it's um, a lack of transparency that people have to know to find this booklet to find that number. So, so just to interject, I think that's really a legislative um, problem and a legislative solution. I was soliciting one. her comment. And, and, and I'm, that's fine. <laughs> but I, I don't, you did. She didn't so, have any. That's right. So, um, so we will probably <laughs> have more discussion in here. I just wanted to get her off the hook that she already had no comment. No comment. Uh, that's fine. I would. I. That's fine. I'm not shutting it off. I'm just moving on. Um, that's all. <coughs> I'll definitely pass that along to the commissioner as well. Yes. But but if, if it's to be listed somewhere, <laughs> it, I think the legislature can say so. And no, I'm going to put in a bill. I just no, wanted I to give her the heads up. Okay. Uh, I mean, nobody can say I don't. Give out, you know, <laughs> yeah. So because um, because I know you folks often hear from individual landowners about different pieces, I just wanted to just signal two pieces. Um, uh, the land exchange tax that I mentioned earlier, um, the calculation of that changed uh, pretty significantly in 2015 statutorily, um, and so that is a formula based on um, valuing whatever the changed piece of the parcel is as a standalone parcel, and then there's a 10% tax on that. And like I said, folks can withdraw their land from the program um, and the lead remains, and, and they're not having to be liable for that land use change tax. But if at any point they develop the land or want the lead removed, they, they do have to pay that land use change tax. Um, so you may hear folks asking about that, and, um, and we're happy to explain that. Because well, you, there's a proposal in the miscellaneous tax bill to change the underlying statute on that. Well, it, the the, other day. Make it yeah. contingently. Yeah, the contingently. Yeah, which yeah. would help because um, right. a lot of times we're, you know, we're holding up um, mortgage right. decisions based on those liens. Yeah. Uh, so what about with a sale, if, if I had property in current <coughs> use and I withdrew it from current use, but I didn't develop it, and the lien is still on it, and I went to sell it, is the lien still on it? Yep, if so the new owner the, wants to continue to develop that, it, they would have to they pay. Can, the they can continue. No, nope. no. They could continue to. They could just enroll it, and it would be current it would carry through. But if they developed it, <coughs> or wanted the lien on, so the lien so we actually have set up in our software. So when someone files a property transfer tax return and answers, um, is this currently in current use? Does the new owner wish to continue it? It triggers a letter that explains that to them, 
and, and you know, gives them a period of time in which okay. they can, because they have a 30 day window, I think, okay. but they can signal that they're transferring it. So it's actually a transfer of the property. And so they don't have to actually pay the land use change. Does the lien show up in the town offices? Yes. Like, yeah. So if you're enrolled in current use under your property in those big books, there's going to be a, the lien of your mortgage holder or whatever, and then the lien. Yeah. Is, okay. Which is why we're so um, militant about maps. Right. Because it's a lien, the state has a lien on the property, so it's both for them. And it might affect the negotiation on the purchase price. Right. That yes. Line of property with a lien. That's on why you have to do a title search. Exactly. That's going to be part of what we're going to discuss. Yeah. 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 Uh, just <clears throat> back to my curiosity about the, the uh, accuracy of assessment. Did, have you folks found that the uh, town, which would assess uh, property that's enrolled in current use, do you find that that, either dispersion or however you want to look at it, is uh, any different from the accuracy of other parcels? I'm just wondering whether or not the local listers or the assessor literally treats enrolled property uh, identically methodologically. Well, um, they certainly are expected to, and we are required um, by statute to do an annual audit of three towns of their current use parcels, specifically for that sort of, you know, is there a disparity in how they're being valued. Um, we find errors and we work with them to fix those things, um, and definitely our current use staff, as they're reviewing applications and if there's any change to enrollments, they are looking at those values, and if they see anything that doesn't look right, they'll ask our district advisor to reach out to the town and work with them to fix that. Um, so I think we're in our third or fourth year of doing the audits where we actually select three towns a year and we'll be coming actually to this committee with that I was going to say, we get a presentation pretty on soon. that. Um, and, and yeah, that's what we're finding is there, there's not some sort of, and this is probably true in general, there's not some sort of nefarious or strategic um, issue that seems to be happening, but, um, mm -hmm. but there are, you know, there are errors. But there are issues. Right. Absolutely. Yep. And we do pay for <coughs> towns as you do this year. I should. I knew. I should have known you would ask, and I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we did uh, Wakefield, Sutton, and Sudbury. Okay. So yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that. <laughs> um, all right. Oh, so the other piece I wanted to just signal, if you have um, constituents who are calling you to complain about current use, uh, is we have an annual agriculture certification. So property that is. Um, has forestry, there's a forest management plan that they are required to, um, to implement and, and submit activity reports on. That um, is, is done through um, forest parks and recreation, and then they let us know. So there isn't sort of a similar examination or audit of agricultural properties. And so a few years ago, as part of some of the changes to the current use legislation, um, this, the legislature has an annual agriculture certification. So it's a very simple process where we mail a letter and a pre-filled form of what our system has on record for that agriculture property. Um, it was about 7000 a year. Um, asking the folks to review that, sign it, and send it back to us, or if it's incorrect or they have changes, to mark that up and send it back to us. Um, and, and it is an enrollment requirement, so we work really hard to make sure that people respond to that and we follow up, um, because if they do not, if they are not certified annually, then um, and they don't respond, then they can theoretically be withdrawn from the program, which is not insignificant. So um, the first year, we, we, you know, you may have seen in the news, we did several iterations of um, telephone and outreach. We worked really closely with the agency of ag to really try to get folks into compliance, um, and we're largely successful. There are still a few of those that, are, um, that have appealed and are being, and being heard, but it's a small figure of that original 7,000. Um, this year we were a little better prepared to send out forceful letters and including more certified mail. And so already out of the 7,000 that were due November 1 of this past fall, there's only um, less than 200 that we haven't heard back from. And in some cases they might be a transfer, in which case they don't need to do it because the new transfer application counts as a certification. So and that's just Agland? Just Agland. Yeah, that was another confusion. Yes, it that. certainly was. Um, yep. So, yep. So if you have any questions, if any in context about that, please let us know. Um, I think the more we do it, I think the more sort of normalized and, and habitual it become. Um, I do think, I genuinely do think we try to make it as easy as possible for folks to do. Um, and I, I think this body might hear some folks bring up the idea of staggering it or doing it, you know, on a rotating cycle. Um, definitely not opposed to that. 
but that being said, there's something about sort of having an annual thing that you don't want to sort of wait a couple years and forget about it. It might actually end up working against us. Yeah. Right. Um, and 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 at the end, it also is you know there's always a handful of properties that are no longer eligible, and so they're not in the program anymore. So it, it, it's carrying out what it's meant to do. <coughs> Is there a recapture when someone uh, defaults or leaves the program involuntarily and doesn't renew? Because obviously it's almost as if it's a withdrawal, only it's a forced withdrawal. Right. So is there a recapture uh, of some of the prior benefits? Um, I don't think, I think we have found that we do not have the authority to recapture benefits received in yeah, here. But the land use change tax would apply, right? right. But yes, in that case, even if it's a, if it's our and action, it's at the higher level. So when you withdraw, there is a, a recoupment. No, no, no. 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 The, the the involuntary withdrawal would be treated the same as the voluntary one. Okay. But in order to get the lien off. Okay. Yeah. So the state would still have that asset. Okay. So that that's where the recapture comes. It's, 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 it's not a recapture. It's, it's not. It's a. It, I, I refer to it as a penalty. But it's basically the land use change tax. It functions like a penalty, um, right. and it's treated, it's the same for everybody. And it's not related to the amount of taxes you didn't pay. It's related to the value of the withdrawn land. Wow. And, but the other the other penalty, if you will, is that you don't pay at the um, at the higher pay. From that point of moment sure. on. Yeah. 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 Uh, not good. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're on page 20, but you're doing great, though. It's, it's really, it's good stuff, and it's really lot. good for us to go through it. But we will, you're on page 25. We have someone coming in at 11. Okay. Um, at the auditor, so it's going to be shifting gears completely. Okay. Um, I've been trying to give people a break between presentations, um, so we probably would want to reschedule you and have you come back. But why don't we get through the... Um, current use, just tell us where the charts are. Sure. So right after that section that. I was discussing starts the um, town by town uh, tables of current use. So the, you know, the, the taxes um, without the rate um, and so on and so forth. So that goes through into the 30s. Um, and like I said, if, if at any point there's data that, that you're not seeing here that you think are reasonable, you can before you have to do that. Um, on page 33 is a summary of the equalization study. I think I've already sort of covered that, and then immediately following that are the CLAs and CODs by town. So there's um, first by county and then by town, so Chittenden County and then the towns there, so on and so forth. Um, let's see. It's good to see where you are, my town is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe I shouldn't point that out while I'm sitting in the front seat. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the, um, the CLAs, they start on mm. page 34. And, and right now, um, the, the window is open for towns that are appealing their equalization study results. They have until the end of January to appeal those results. Like I said, we publish those right after Christmas. The Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, quick question. Yeah. Um, so, on the, I was just checking out Middlebury, we are in the middle of a reappraisal, so, um, you know, in fact, I thought I would hear any moment what, you know, what my new appraised value of my house is. So, is this what they have to use for FY20, using that assumption for the grand list, or will it change if we get the reappraisal done in the next few months? Right, so what the, once the reappraisal is complete and certified and approved, then that's when the are set. So, so it could go into effect for FY20 for July 1st. I think so. You know? yeah. The yeah. grand list is lodged. Done. Right. On April 1st. Right. Yeah. So it's whatever's in effect. By April 1st. Yeah. And, and towns that are actually in the middle of a reappraisal, their, their equalization study process is a little different because of that exact fact. So okay. um, there's a different methodology for setting their yeah. once they're going through a reappraisal. So why don't you just go through the, the um, get up to the statutory exemptions yes. and then we'll break. Yes, perfect. Um, so let's see. That's on page 51. Well, we'll um, we won't do those. We'll come back to those because okay. those are going to be longer than a three-minute discussion, okay. I think. Okay. Um, 
but there's the summary of listed values and um, by category, which I think is interesting. On page 49. It's as though you knew where my tabs were. <laughs> so, um, so in the grand list, in the software that we use, and then in what we collect and what we analyze, there are multiple, um, as we talked about earlier, you know, those categories that different parcels fit into. So, on page forty-nine is a is a is a count of those. Um, and then, yeah, is there a description of what R one and R two? I may have missed that. Something. Not in the book. There is in the book. Um, How do we find out what single people? family basically? That's a good question. Should do that first. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. OTH might be other. Right, and different, you know, for example, the UE, UO, there's different utilities that fit in those two different buckets, and then there's a separate one for cable. Yeah, so that's a good one. Thank you. But it just gives you a sense of sort of where the um, values are in the state. The bulk of them. The bulk of them. And that's also shown in sort of a on page 48 in the, the, the chart that just sort of breaks it out. Yeah. Yes, with real words. Right yes, chart. I see that. <laughs> that's, that's a benefit. Okay. Good. So um, shall I? Yeah, Jill, up here. Just uh, does the uh, use uh, mechanism, use value appraisal, bump up against in any way uh, the uh, growing uh, increase in conservation easements on parcels in Vermont? I assume one could have a conservation own land that was subject to a conservation easement, and that value would still be higher than the use value of appraisal, and so one could enroll in that as well. And uh, I just don't know if you know how many acres are subject to use value that are also in the conservation easement program. There's no reason you would, because it's, I assume, there run is by a, a different. There is a lot of overlap for sure. But there is, okay, okay. I'm just sort of curious because it seems like a natural. So I'm going to give us five minutes. Uh, Doug Hopper's coming in at 11, so please um, come back and we will hear from him. Okay, and thank we'll, you. And we'll be we'll for the rest of the report. Okay, great. Thank you. I don't need to go, but I do enjoy saying my name's Doug Hopper and I'm the state auditor. So it's being recorded. It's being recorded. Yeah. This is your mic. Yeah, those are the speakers. <laughs> that those are recording. The report, uh, to answer your question, and by the way, thank you for inviting me, covers more ground than just the business incentives. <clears throat> As I think you know, some of you know, I've, I've been working on these issues for many years before I became state auditor. In the uh, but part of my job now is to assist you by researching uh, various state programs so that I can help you make good resource allocation decisions by knowing which programs work well, which ones don't work as well. Economic development is a challenge for many reasons, uh, even the best design programs. But we do have some programs that present serious problems for my office. One of them is, of course, veggie, because the but for can't be validated. Auditors need evidence, and the, own, the decisions made by the private entities who are applicants are made in boardrooms. That information is not available to me. Um, there are others that present. So, uh, I'm going to stop you just, just briefly. and. Um, there are new members of the committee. Uh, there are four people who didn't serve on this committee last year. Um, they have varying levels of knowledge about these programs. So it might be good if you uh, um, talk a little bit about what the program is. Sure. As you're critiquing it. The program is now 12 years old. Its predecessor was 97 or 98. The first one was a tax credit. This is not quite that construction. But basically, it's the, the predicate is companies come to the entity, the Economic Progress Council. I think 11 members, most appointed by the governor, and say, we understand you have an incentive. We're thinking about expanding here as opposed to elsewhere or not at all. And if you give us this incentive, we'll get it done. But we need your help. They're basically saying, effectively, if not for or but for this incentive, we would not create these 27 jobs or make this million dollar capital investment, whatever the case may be. And that is the foundation of the program. Everything after that is mechanical, and they run it pretty well. But that is the point. That can't be verified. Now, that's not the only challenging economic development program from my perspective. Another one is tourism and marketing. The private sector, according to the economic census, spends between 80 and $100 million a year on marketing and advertising. They have to. That's their business. 
the state spends a little more than $3 million a year. There is no methodology, none. And I've talked to Quebec about this for years, your economist. How could we possibly measure the impact of the state's contribution to that marketing and advertising, total marketing and advertising budget? There is no way. Uh, so I can't tell you effectively what we're getting for that $3 million. Now, as you may recall, a few years ago, uh, Tourism and Marketing came in with a proposal that you dedicate a portion of the growth of rooms and meals taxes to that program. The inference was that if it grows, it's because of them. Well, they provided some data, but it wasn't all the data. And I caught it, Tom caught it, and he had a fiscal note about that and some related matters. And it showed quite clearly that as you guys, for a variety of reasons, had been decreasing the appropriation for tourism and marketing, the rooms and meals tax revenues were increasing. So there was no direct correlation at all, let alone causality. In fact, it was going the other way. So, uh, and that is their primary performance measure, is rooms and meals tax, as if what they do is a direct contributor to that outcome. And I don't believe you can prove that. That's not to say these things are bad, but the question that I was confronted with is, how can I help you and your colleagues across the hall and others make better decisions with better information? Well, there's a rich literature out there about economic development, has been for decades, about all of these subjects. So we spent a great deal of time reviewing the literature and providing it to you, and uh, it's pretty dramatic. I mean, the fact is, you know, business incentives have been the subject of research for a long time, mostly since the late 70s, early 80s, when it really ramped up for a variety of reasons. But uh, there's something that came out this summer, which was just after the report was published, which is very, very powerful for a lot of reasons. The most important is that it's done by Timothy Bartik, who is the godfather of this stuff in America. He works at the Upjohn Institute, very well respected, uh, totally objective. I, I can't even tell if he likes business and science. I was going to say, how do you become the godfather of this stuff? You do good research, and you get cited hundreds and hundreds of times by people who respect your work. Um, so he decided, uh, he felt, I, I presume, that there was enough research on this core question, which is the but four for him to do a meta-analysis and look at the 34 studies that he found that he thinks are reputable and work through all of them and come out at the end with what he did. And I can send you uh, the abstract of the full report if you like. He basically said, based on good research, and, and he evaluated all of them and acknowledged that some have positive and negative biases and so forth, that somewhere between 75 and 98 percent of all of the economic activities supposedly incentivized would have happened anyway. And in fact, uh, Tom Cabet and myself and others have been saying that for years. Uh, this guy's the real deal. And I will share the report with you. I'm sorry. I think I sent you my report, but not yeah, this so one. So just so you know, your report is up in back of you here, oh, but you. only on page one, because you're talking generally. Um, and then we also have it on our website for anybody who wants to look there. So, so the, the bottom line is, uh, you know, when you learn information like, when you get information like this, it should make you think, well, whatever we're spending on that program, we should think, what else could we spend it on where we could actually know and measure the return on investment? Because we all share the same goal. I presume everybody wants more and better jobs and a healthy economy and livable wages and all that good stuff. The question is, we just don't have that much money for economics. So we need to make the most of it. So what the report does is provide you guys some information about the other strategies and what the research says about them. Some of it's just a, a no-brainer. There are some things that are not typically part of the economic development conversation that I think should be, like affordable housing. We hear business people, your colleagues, the governor, everybody and their brother saying we need more housing, we need affordable housing. But somehow it's not part of the economic development conversation. In fact, affordable housing checks off a whole bunch of boxes right away. It creates jobs instantly. And if you made a 10-year commitment to this for the whole year, you're going to create a lot of jobs. You're going to create demand for good paying, relatively good paying jobs in the trades. Second, it creates a 100-year asset. Third, it, it provides a, an answer to this difficult challenge that people are telling us. We can't attract people to live here. It's too expensive and so forth. I, I think that varies around the state, of course. But uh, So there's a lot going on with housing. It should be obvious, but it's not for some reason. And furthermore, when you do it, uh, I, I know you collectively with the governor a couple of years ago devoted some uh, additional resources to housing. If you're going to do more of it, I would encourage you to talk to the people at the Champlain Housing Trust and learn about perpetually affordable housing. Because the way it's typically done, in fact, 
not so much uh, DHCB, they get it, they've been in this business a long time, but if you just say we're going to build housing that's affordable to middle income folks, that's great. So you buy the house with your family, but 10 years later you decide for any number of reasons to move up or move out, you're going to want all that appreciation. So the house is no longer going to be as affordable as it was when you got it. What the Champlain Housing Trust, the old land trust model does, is retain some of that appreciation in the property so the next low or moderate income family can afford it. It's brilliant. And there's an incredible report by uh, one of our great natural resources, John Davis, on this thing about eight years ago that I'll send you. It's really well done about the history of the program. Other um, strategies or approaches to economic development that make sense and are measurable are also well known to you. you know, small businesses. You might start a business and have a great idea. Right? You were well wrapped 30 years ago. And, but the, the thing worked so well that five years later you got you know, 28 employees and you don't know anything about HR or all that stuff. You need help. Uh, maybe the expansion requires some financing. That's not your thing. Technical assistance for small businesses is very good. A very good investment. Obviously, workforce education and training. Fantastic. And I would argue uh, that one of the other programs that's difficult for me to, uh, to evaluate, and I wrote a memo on this a few years ago, as you know, is the Vermont Training Program. That program basically is rewarding companies that are growing and paying them to train their new hires. But that's the cost of doing business. If you're dealer.com and you're hiring people like crazy, you got to train them. Everybody's got to train new employees. The statute says very clearly, you can train, you can get a grant to train new hires, but it has to be supplemental training, not replacement. The point being, taxpayers shouldn't pay for training that you would have paid for anyway. Yet if you look at the numbers from the VTP on where the money's gone, it's gone to 10 or 15 companies year after year after year. So Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Where did you put the training money? You said work it was staying stay training, training, but it, let's, the, what's it, the problem it, that we yeah. keep hearing about? Yeah. There aren't enough bodies or bodies with the right skills in the right places. So if you've got to focus on expanding the pool, all the money from the Vermont training program goes to people that already have jobs. Now, I'm happy for them, and I'm glad that the companies are expanding. But is that the best use of your training? Limited training dollars. You only have 1.3 million for VTP. Um, so that's an issue to me. Other things that make sense. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, no. Finish your sentence. That's okay. Right. Okay. Good. Um, on affordable housing, I think I heard a story on VPR a while back, um, mid late fall or something like that, to the effect that that all our millions of bond money um, wasn't necessarily going where it was most needed or wasn't going for, and I've been trying to find that story and, and ask about it and I wonder if you were aware of it or remember or anything to that effect. The subject is of interest to me. Yeah. It's so recent I'm not sure it's ripe for an audit yet, but um, we can certainly make inquiries. Yeah, no, I'm not asking about an audit, just if you heard the story. I don't recall it. Okay, I'll think I'll, 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 I'll put an inquiry out and I'll see if I can find out. If the money was directed to BHCB, then without doing an audit or investigation, I, I would feel comfortable. They're very capable. They've got a tremendous track record, but I don't know where all the money went. You know, it's, um, it's, it's something to the effect of, of, I don't think anybody was breaking rules, but somehow um, in, in areas or something where it was most need, where we most needed for affordable housing, it wasn't appearing, something to that effect. That's the other box that affordable housing can check if you choose to. Bennington County, distressed community, direct the money there. Northeast Kingdom, you know, the other stuff is pretty diffuse, but for things like affordable housing, you can say, we're going to do it there and there and there, period. And you can do it as long as it takes to solve their local problem. <clears throat> Another, I'm sorry. Scott, yeah. Sure. Um, just one comment, uh, Jim. I spoke to uh, Tate Brooks at the yeah, administration. Yeah. They're coming out on Friday with an updated report of how much of that bond's been spent, where it's been spent, and I yeah. see it all forwarded to you. Yeah, yeah please um, do. But uh, it's a question for, for you, and I've asked a lot of different people, a lot of different levels of government about this, and it goes to affordable housing. And don't have to give the answer today if you don't know it, but I'm curious to find out about this in the future. We have these affordable... Um, living that's we're paying in St. Johnsbury upwards of three hundred to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars for an apartment to be renovated renovated for an affordable living situation and I don't know how we I mean that, that just kills me that we're spending that kind of money for an apartment when we could be providing a lot more apartments 
for the same amount of money. Do you have any insight as to why that is so expensive? No, I don't know anything about St. Johnsbury, but I do know. Okay. That well, I hear this in other towns too. It's not just particular yeah. to St. Johnsbury. I do know that if you want to have perpetually affordable housing, which not all these projects do, you have to have a built-in subsidy at the front end. There's no question about it. Right. I get now, that. Those dollars, I, I don't know what housing costs in, in St. Johnsbury, but it sounds crazy. Oh, I could build an apartment or a group of them for $100,000 a piece. Well, they're not that cheap anymore, first of all. Uh, second, I'd have to look into it, and I'd be happy to do that. But I encourage you, the people who are expert in these are not only DHCB, they're just down the street, I think, uh, but CHT from Burlington. Those people, Brenda Torpy, who you know, yeah. Mike Monte, these yeah. guys know their business, and they're straight shooters. They will not BS you. They'll tell you exactly what they do and why and what their results are. I have great respect for these guys. I'd invite them in. Now, this isn't really your bailiwick. Well, I was going to say this. If, you know, we're not the housing committee, right. um, but if the housing but you have so much is free being, time. It's being funded with tax credits or something like right. that, or we're being asked to put tax credits into yeah. something which we're convinced doesn't work and it ought to be diverted to housing, it's helpful for us to know about it. But, you um, do. The housing credits are used by banks and insurance yeah, companies, as right. you know, so yeah. you have a little bit of that. We had a funny program. There was a program that was proposed last year um, that was a housing oh, yeah. rehabilitation program that Ish. really was not ready. Um, and I can't remember what was wrong with it, but it really didn't make any sense to us here. I looked into it because Barry is one of those communities that has a <clears throat> very large vacancy rate, partly because we have a lot of junk. <laughs> right. And it was H 766. Yeah. It was. Uh, died here, I think. It did die. It was not ready for prime time, as you say. I, I suspect it may be an ideological issue because it was uh, propelled by credits. There was no appropriation associated. But it was to recover properties that had been vacant for a while, uh, were limited to single and duplex to get home ownership going in properties that would be rescued. My understanding, because I asked my colleague uh, Tommy Walls, that the administration does intend to re reintroduce it with a slightly different funding mechanism. I'm not sure okay. we'll see it uh, because I warned them that it died here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I may have to jump here. There was something other than the use of the tax credits that was problematic, and it had to do with the way it was targeted. Um, and right. it just it, it didn't didn't seem like a good use of money. Um, to us, um, and it really wasn't advocated very aggressively by any other committee either. No other committee um, really wanted it that much. I think Commerce approved it. I think Commerce had it. Um, they, they, they just said, we don't care. We're moving it out of here, letting you guys do what you want with it. Uh, not to give any secrets away. Jim. What if you want to do a project? Wonderful. That's just wonderful. Well, just so there are some other things that, yeah. that uh, the literature suggests. Uh, Is there a question? question? Oh, no, I was, um, yeah, I was recalling what you were recalling. I, I just don't remember the details of it. Um, well, th there were some, some things that didn't seem to be very well thought through. Yeah. I'd be interested in looking at it if it came back in some form or something. It felt like it was attacking the right problem, but it just wasn't doing it in the right way. Um, yeah, Agreed. Yeah. No, we may see it again. That'll be, or some version of it. I just was trying to remember what it was. Some of the other approaches that I thought uh, literature suggests uh, provide a better return or certainly a more measurable return include uh, energy efficiency, uh, which also can be targeted just like money for affordable housing. Uh, we spend a lot of money on that now. There's some questions in the community, and I hear this frequently, because I think uh, Efficiency Vermont doesn't tell its story very well. Having said that, they may be ripe for an audit. I looked at that last year, but they were in the midst of their tri-annual financial audit. We didn't want to bother them. But I mentioned our conversation as a chair a while back to a fellow who I would invite in. Of course, then again, it's not really your bailey right, 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 yeah. yeah. It's a lot of money. Unless we're looking at the efficiency charge, which we've got this kind of like weird system that. Yeah. Um, that, you know, we might look at but probably the Another good one is something that I talked about in the report almost 20 years ago called the leaky bucket, and that is uh, we buy collectively, both as state government and as individuals and businesses, a lot of goods and services from outside Vermont, some of which can be produced here and are. And 
some of this can be done by anchor institutions that, have, that buy a lot of goods and services. A number of years ago, uh, we worked with some people at Ben Fletcher Allen because they, they produce 5,000 meals a day. So it's ridiculous how much food they put out. It's a big, big, big user. And they had somebody at the time who got it and said, yeah, we will put the time into trying to buy more locally produced food. And they do, and they have, and it's significant. And now it's become sort of a national model. Uh, there are hospitals all over the country doing this, and it makes perfect sense, and colleges should do it. The state does some of it when they can. Uh, but we did an audit a while back. You have phones that bring in here. <laughs> the red phone. So uh, another one is energy, which was something I discussed in that report. And we did an audit a couple of years ago about the state agency energy plan. This is about 20 years ago, the state decided that they should walk the walk. And you guys, periodically over time, have said, this is our goal. The last one, I think, was 09 or 011, and you instructed BGS and others for the state to reduce its energy consumption 5% a year. Well, they haven't done that for a variety of reasons. But to their credit, BGS now has some good professional staff, so they're beginning to make some improvements. But efficiency is so obvious. It reduces costs of all these ancillary environmental and other now learning health benefits as well. That's a good one. I mentioned technical assistance, or did I not? Yes, for small businesses. Yeah. Yeah. Another one that gets a lot of play is childcare. The labor market doesn't work without childcare, period. Right? All, I mean, in, in my generation, I had one parent that worked, and that was the case in the 50s and 60s, and that's not the case today. And it needs to be affordable and available everywhere. But you don't hear much conversation about it as it relates to economic development. You hear it as a social infrastructure piece, which is important, but not directly related to the labor market. About 20 years ago in New Hampshire, uh, they did a study and asked the business community to come in and say, let's figure out what the costs are to having insufficient capacity and unaffordable childcare in terms of low morale, people coming in late, having to leave, pick up the kid who's sick, all that stuff is just life. And it was substantial, it was billions of dollars. There's no hiding from that, but that's an investment. It's different than veggie. I mean, veggie's sort of a, a faith-driven thing. Yeah, yeah, but so that for the most part, veggie rewards companies that are already successful. They wouldn't be coming in saying we're going to create 27 jobs if they didn't have demand for that in their business. You know, you don't create jobs because of incentives. So, so, uh, so understand, this is more just I'm curious what you think, and I'm, I'm not advocating this position necessarily, but um, I understand that the but for test and veggie is kind of a net that we all have decided to buy in. But the reality is that states do compete, um, and there's a bidding war that goes on that has nothing to do with the but for test. It's just a bidding war. And I, um, I just, you know, there, there, I can understand why policymakers are not willing to step out of that bidding war. Because it's, it, you know, it, you're always worried about jobs. You're always worried about the economy. Um, that's kind of just part of why we're here, in some ways. And so, um, do you, it, do you, have, do you have a comment about that bidding war? I and, certainly do. Uh, okay. Uh, um, first of all, the that statement, your assumption, is predicated on the belief that interstate movement of businesses is responsible for the creation or destruction of a lot of jobs. First of all, there's no official data on that. The only data I've ever seen uh, suggests that that is not true, not even close. That at most, two to three percent of all the jobs created and destroyed in this country are because of interstate business moves. Two to three percent. Yet, the veggie program is one of the most significant in terms of cost of all the programs you support. And yet it's tiny compared to other states. It doesn't matter what other states do if nobody, if their businesses aren't really moving around that much. You hear about it in the context of BMW and Boeing and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, the Amazon. That's just not happening in Vermont and New Hampshire. It's just not. But I mean, the, the, the recruitment of Amazon is a classic example of a bidding war that we fortunately couldn't even have gotten to, you know, the, the pre-, pre Part of it. Yeah, but, but we when you look at where they went, they didn't go where they went for the tax incentive, they went for the workforce and the ancillary benefits sure of being with, I mean, yeah. may, maybe, but, you know, I don't think you can base yeah. economic But, but that's, that's the problem with this, is that there is this, there is this myth out there. If everybody believes it, then it's like it's true. You don't have to make policy based on myth if you choose not to. 
uh, and we do that quite a bit, frankly. And partly this report, there's a section at the end uh, that is dear to me that's a data section. And it addresses with some charts, graphs mostly. Could you walk us through the report a little bit for those of us who have then made it last night? Sure. And just last night, it was only 73 pages. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as I say, basically, yeah. I point out in the, in the cover memo that there are that sort of some major programs in our economic development basket that I can't uh, audit. evaluate. Can't audit. Right. So I then say, because of that, I'd like to share with you our summary of the literature on many of these other approaches, including business incentives, and tourism, for that matter, tourism and marketing, and just see what the literature says about them. Yeah, and, that, and this is the cover letter. You mentioned, I think you mentioned all except the RDCs and TIFs. You mentioned right. veggie and tourism. And the now, to be clear, I, I'm of mixed mind on TIF. Mm -hmm. I live in Burlington. I love my city, but I don't think we needed a TIF. It's the biggest city <laughs> in the state. It's on the lake. It's got the hospital, the university. You know, we're going to develop the downtown, as we have over the years smaller, distressed communities around the state, right. as it makes more sense. I don't like the fact that it that it takes a bite out of the Ed Fund. For the moment, that's unavoidable, but anyway, those are the five. Yes, TIF, RDC, VTP, yep. Tourism and Market and Budget. So the rest of the report basically has chapters, for lack of a better word, on various approaches to economic development and what the literature says about them. The last section is a data section, just okay. talking, speaking of myths, where I address the myths about Vermont and taxes, the myths about the business climate, and the myths about migration using IRS data. So should we talk about those for a minute? If you like. All right. At the very end. Very end. Starts around page 15 or something. 59. If people take that one hard copy, we'll have one out for you. Yeah. Yeah. Is it page 58? I just want to say while they're getting this up that I thought the grass were really wonderful. Mm -hmm. And, and um, if it's OK with you, I would like to use some of those. Of course. Yeah. Okay. We paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the point. Uh, the tax stuff is not news to you, so we'll skip that. But the, the well, don't skip that. Uh, wait for new people. Oh, I'm so sorry. don't skip things. <laughs> so, uh, I don't even remember the sequence. Like business I, climate. Yeah, business yeah. climate yeah. is yeah. a first. Business myth. climate's first. Six and six that one drives me crazy mm -hmm. because it, you know, Good typically man. you have yeah. media outlets, everything from the local weekly to national networks. And if Forbes or the Tax Foundation or somebody else puts out, and they do every year, their latest report on the business climate and the rankings of the states, uh, but nobody bothers to dig in and say, well, what's their methodology? What questions are they asking and what data sources are they using and so forth? And not surprisingly, since most of these are driven by business-funded and business-oriented organizations who have a mission to lower taxes on them and well-to-do people, that's one of them, of course, uh, to drive out unions, because one of the measures they almost always look at is whether it's a, a friendly state or whether you have those nasty unions and um, you know things like that. So if you dig into the methodology, and people have done this, and I, I cite one of them in this report. It's a wonderful study by a guy from uh, Minnesota, I think. Uh, and it's called Grading Places. Yeah. And he reviews. I've seen it. You've yeah, seen it. Yeah. I've seen it. Uh, Good. And he reviews the five of the, the big ones, the rankers, yeah. and basically, you know, just shreds them yeah. because they're they're not predictive; they're a joke. Yeah. Except when I see one that I like, and with this, it's actually pretty good. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, yeah. so um, I pretty much agree with what you're saying. The fact is that people like sound bites; they hear it. They're not going to dig into the methodology. They're not going to read that. And so what happens is they say, look what Forbes said. Forbes is respected. They don't, they don't go into all of that in depth. So it's kind of difficult to fight this um, when so that's how people drives. are. Yeah. And, and you're not going to spend a long time no. looking at this. And so then the word gets out, and then it becomes the truth after a while, you know, whether it's the truth. Or not. So, well, part of the problem so we is have that a bigger problem than just the data. I mean, that the, uh, the most recent strategic plan by ACCD includes a section that refers to these things and says, some people believe them and rely on them, so I guess we have to. I could not disagree more. If I were Mike Shirley, and I like Mike, he's a good guy, and he gets some of this stuff, uh, but if, if you see this stuff come out and you know it is not an accurate characterization of our state, then I would stand up and say so. And I would say, I'm the secretary of this agency, and this is baloney, and here's why. 
-hmm. and the data is easy to find. And I give you some of it. Yeah. First of all, it's not predictive yeah, yeah. because you know those those I picked three of them. They say, well, these are the top ten. I said, okay, well, let's see how Vermont fares on some standard metrics because we're ranked 46th. But in fact, we're right in the middle of their top ten on these measures, and you see that up and down the line. So I would expect that the governor and you know I've been around long enough and almost every governor tips his hat to this stuff and says, boy, you know, because of this, we got to do this, this, or this. Well, no. We have a mission, collectively, to make improvements in the economy on behalf of Vermonters, but don't buy this stuff. It's baloney. They're very good at getting it into the media. They're very yeah. successful. It's everywhere, all the time. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't serve this discourse at all. It bothers me. It's the heck out of me. So if you want to, I'll send you grading places. It's, it's a little bit of a read. Yeah, I, I, I just, I thought maybe Sorsha can get a link to it. Um, to all of us. I read it a, a while ago. I don't know how long. He updates it periodically. He updates it, yeah. yeah a while ago. But, you know, one of the responses is, is just to say that the, the generally question the way these rankings oh, yeah. are done and not do it on the detail because nobody's going to cover it. Exactly. Um, but anyway. So the other one is, uh, I think the last one is migration. And we hear a lot of talk about that. So I'm sorry, you didn't do taxes. Oh. You, did, you skipped it. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I think. <laughs> This is an interesting one because uh, many of these rankings efforts talk about taxes, but what they talk about is the top marginal rate. That's all they do. Now, you know, uh, the ones who've been around, maybe the new guys haven't seen it yet, but JFO over time has done a number of reports that dig into this. And the most recent one was very interesting, um, although they've all been interesting. And they break it out and say, well, the tax study. Yeah, yeah. What, what is the burden so-called? Interestingly, they're better at messaging, too. They call it a burden as opposed to a responsibility. Um, and they break it out by income class. And Vermont looks, and I have some of that here, in fact. If you scroll down a little bit on a couple of graphs, it's very dramatic. Uh, for the lowest quintile and the second quintile, we look really good, frankly, which is the whole intent of a state that tries as best it can to have a progressive <coughs> tax structure. Now, we suffer a little bit because of the property tax. Even though we, uh, we've done good work on the education side, the municipal property tax is terribly regressive and awful. Um, but anyway, this stuff blows up the commentary about how terrible Vermont is. Do we have a comparatively high so-called burden on, on well-to-do people? Yes. That's a conscious choice we have by services policymakers too. in this state for many, many years. Um, Although the information that we got about sort of what the the effective or was uh, from choice the effective rate of you know say two hundred thousand yeah. AGI were actually pretty good. It's um, like five percent. Yeah. yeah, it's been that way for years. Right. But you know, Forbes won't tell you that. Right. They'll just tell you it's eight point nine five or whatever well, the heck it is. Actually, now. reduce the top marginal yeah. rate, move on the base, and reduce the rate of the Yeah. So the tax part just provides some data to debunk or help begin to debunk some of these myths. So that's part three of the report. It's one that matters to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, and the last one, of course, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, is migration. And, uh, you know, you, you see, you see uh, news accounts of the United Van Lines study or whatever. Well, that's mm -hmm. fine, but give me a break. Uh, IRS publishes good data on migration, and it gets better over time. Now they break it out by age and income, which is very cool. Um, and, and some of the graphs I put in, or maybe even in the text, make very clear that some of what we hear, which is typically very dark, everybody's leaving. Vermont stinks, right? All those old people are leaving because of our tax burden and so forth. Well, here's one for you. And, and we're getting too old. That's, that's my favorite. <laughs> How can you get too to satellites? Right? <laughs> <laughs> we uh, want to keep all the old people here, but we're complaining because we're too old. You look at the data on the number of percentage of uh, folks over 65 that have left New Hampshire and Vermont. New Hampshire is about twice Vermont. <clears throat> But what a surprise, because they're twice the population. But wait, we've been told that Vermont is horrible, and New Hampshire is this paradise of no tax, which isn't true. Then why are they losing elders at exactly the same rate as we are? Because people age and go to the sun, for goodness sake. It's not complicated. Um, also, all young people are leaving. Well, first of all, young people have been leaving the northern tier and rural areas of this country for 100 years. That's nothing new. Uh, so I looked at the, the data from IRS on people under 26. Vermont's loss rate was 9.5%. New Hampshire's was 9.3%. I mean, really. 
Is it a problem? Yeah. But then if you go to the last table, very interesting to me, and I've done this a number of times over the years, just take a bunch of occupational titles, common ones. Keep going if you can. Yeah. Seventy three. Seventy two? Seventy three? Seventy three. Seventy three. Sorry. I just don't want to make you busy by scrolling. Yeah. Page seventy three. This one? Yes, ma'am. So if you take a bunch of occupational terms and ask yourself the question first, what is the median wage for that occupational title here and in New York and Boston? Just for a comparison. And as you can see, this is no surprise to most of you, you can make fifteen to forty percent more. If you move to the city, yeah. Yes. Yeah, but the city costs a lot more, so you you really have to have some kind of adjustment for purchasing power. Because yes, you'll be paid more, but you'll be paying a hell of a lot more for your. Not as much as you think. I'm you, I'm just saying I think you need to. I have that data from BEA. Okay. okay. The fact is, young people are not buying homes in Manhattan when they come out of college. They're getting an apartment with friends. So it's not as if you. And furthermore, they're not living in Manhattan. For sure. Right. <laughs> so, you know, they live where they can and they do what they can. But if you come out of uh, undergraduate school with a lot of debt, you don't have the luxury for the most part of saying, I don't mind, I love Vermont. I'm going to give up on the job that pays me 65 grand Got it. to stay here and pay 30. Got it. Got it. So, moreover, look at the number in the far right column of each one. Those are the annual openings for each of those occupations, both from growth and replacement. It's almost nothing. So part of the problem, and it is a problem, is that we're small, for goodness sake. We're a tiny little place, and we can't absorb all the young people who come out of college, period. It can't be done. A lot of auditors, huh? <laughs> you like that? Why are there so many nurses? Because we're getting a big deal. old. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a growing Healthcare is a big deal. I'm focused on the carpenters. <clears throat> yeah. well, it's pretty low I'm compared wondering about to auditors. Other engineers, because I know that carpenters. maybe you just picked electrical, but there are, because they're small, but I know the businesses around this state, they need engineers. I mean, I've got the wrong kind, I guess. I don't know what the right kind of engineers are, but um, there is a, there's a huge gap in businesses well, who need engineers. Econ 101 says if you pay them, they will come yes. or stay. So now that's not easy necessarily, but our wage structure in the private sector is a problem. Mm -hmm. But isn't it interesting that almost no one ever talks about that? Mm -hmm. They would rather us have our neighbors believe that the policies that you create are responsible for all these outcomes, and they're not. And they never talk about the private sector, which is weird. We used to talk about it on old board meetings, and board members would say people they have to pay more because um, they think living in Vermont is worth something a whole lot more, and so we don't have to pay them as much. It's a problem. It's yeah. an attitude problem. So, but this data comes from <coughs> the, the that's our Oh, this data is yeah. from DLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics. Oh, I, I kept hearing DLS. I'm sorry. sorry. DLS, yeah. Okay. So, the data section was fun. I do enjoy creating yeah. graphs. I'm worried about the libraries. Yeah. You know, we got two librarians in the house now. That's a lot of libraries. It reads anything longer than 200 people. Librarians, that's kind of a lot. Um, that's what I wanted to be when I was in grade school. Librarian. Yeah. It's an honorable profession. I do. I went to a library education. Did you really? Yes. Look at us now. That's my dream job. So, anyway, um, for those who've been on the committee and certainly the chair, my views about veggie are not new. I think the report by Timothy Bartik is very, very powerful. I'm sorry, you think what? The, the report by Bartik is very, very Bartik. powerful. Yeah. And, yes. Um, we can continue on the path we're on for another 10 or 20 years. Admittedly, states have very limited ability to affect the economy in the short term. Right? We are a speck at the end of the tail of the beast, and it's the federal budget, and it's currency exchange rates, and it's trade agreements, and interest rates. We have no control over any of that stuff. Even more reason, in my view, to spend every precious dollar in ways that you are as certain as you can be is a wise investment, either in people or infrastructure. So one of the other things that occurred to me, I know you and I had a brief email exchange about it, but um, our unemployment rate is really low. Um, and it struck me at some point this summer, I was looking at that and thinking, 
when your unemployment rate is low, why are you putting money into creating jobs? Why aren't you, when you don't have enough workers, why aren't you putting your money into training or recruiting workers? And it's not low everywhere. Uh, well, it's, it's not low in Bennington County. Okay, um, but it, but we veggie is um, that's a good response. Um, but the the money that we allocate through veggie is not going to Bennington County. No, it's not, not as a rule. Um, because that's yeah. not where the growing companies are. So yeah, it's the growing companies that ask for incentives to subsidize right. the growth they would have done anyway. Yeah, but we're creating jobs where we have jobs. Yes. For the most part. On the labor yeah. side. Um, and, that's, and so that's the point. It's not, that wasn't a, move, move from unemployment yeah. to the labor market. We hear yeah. uh, from many people over the last couple of years about the labor market. Yeah. And it's complicated and it's easy to get lost in it. And people yeah. misuse the information data. But our labor participation rate is pretty good by national standards. It's about 70%. Uh, and a lot of the people that have left the labor market, what a surprise, are just my age core retiring. Yeah. It's, no, it's no big deal. Right. Um, do we have enough people going forward? You could argue that we could use some growth. But what I'm getting at is some members of that cohort that are not in the labor force but of traditional working age don't have to work, choose not to work, whatever. But some of them, uh, BLS measures this through the current population survey. When asked, if you're not employed, have you looked for work in the last four weeks? And if you say no, then you're not even considered in the labor force. But you might say, actually, I do want to work. But I've been home taking care of a sick relative. My car is broken. My skills are not valued around here. Um, you know, I can't find a job within 100 miles, whatever it may be, and they're referred to, sadly, as the marginally attached. The point is, <laughs> there are more it's than a really few. It's really It is. It's terrible. It sounds like a novel title. I'm really depressed. Yeah. So, uh, I'm sorry. I was depressed. That sounded like a DSM, you know. <laughs> Diagnostic marginally attached. Like marginally attached. But those folks, some of them, really do want to be in the labor market and obviously employed. They are here right now. Yeah. So why should we even have a conversation about spending $3 million to market Vermont to get other people to move here, before we have enough affordable housing, by the way, then provide the assistance to Vermonters to take those jobs that are being vacated by all of our my age cohort that are retiring and leaving those jobs open? So, you know, there's so much more we could be doing, but it's we're not really... But it really requires some strategic thinking about what is actually happening in our economy as opposed to what have we always done and how do we tinker with this like mm -hmm. now, And even for those, I think Mike Sherling would admit this, I think he would, that it's appropriate to pivot, yeah. begin to pivot. The question is, you only have this much money. And to say, we're going to move some of that money over here, this room will be filled with, forgive me, the oh, shiny yeah. shoe crowd that will uh, they'll come and say, you know, you're taking away my program. And without my program, I'll leave or I can't grow or succeed. There's got to be some political will around this. Yeah. It's a really hard issue. Dare them. Just dare them. Just what? Dare them. Dare them. Um, I just am curious. I was once a census taker and I worked on CPS. Is the data as it's uh, presented publicly available? Uh, is it? Uh, geographically current sensitive. Current population those, survey. Current, I'm sorry, yeah, current population survey. And it does ask, I was, you know, yep. would you join the labor force, yeah. but but for the wages are low or blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But would it report uh, how many marginally attached folks are in Bennington County, for instance, is it geographically sensitive? I, I don't know how the data, <coughs> I generated it, but it's I don't know. It's very challenging because the sample size for Vermont is so small. small yeah. You can't slice and dice as much as you would like. You get that at the national level, <coughs> but the whole, the whole sample in households in Vermont is about 1,200. Okay. And it rotates, as you know. People are in for three or four months and then they're out and so forth. Uh, but no. So you wouldn't know, essentially, Not where, really. where they're located. It's very challenging. I, we, we kind of know where the distressed areas are. Sure. Right. I mean, to me, I think that in this whole economic development discussion, the dichotomy between some of the faster growing areas and the rest of the state is key because the the parts of the state that are that have the higher unemployment, that are losing population, that's where the resources would go, which is what you were talking about earlier. Because otherwise, it's going to pull down the fast growing areas. And, and unfortunately, I see the reverse. I see, even with things like affordable housing, because housing prices have accelerated so much in, you know, in Burlington area, that's where they're going to build more housing, as they should. But that means that you're investing resources in the areas that are already growing quickly. So we have to figure out a way 
to, um, to, to reallocate, and it's not happening naturally. Um, but what I hear you say, you know, you went through affordable housing, small businesses, workforce training, energy efficiency, <coughs> child care, and to try to do all these things in a way that can be measured, that you're actually accomplishing things. One of the ways I think about economic development is if you do the basics really, really well, like wastewater, so you know, drinking water, yeah. telecommunications. Right? You do the basics really well, and you could include childcare. You know, those, if you do those really well, then the private sector will do the economic development that you want, and that that's a more reliable way to do it than to try to you know hand out little bits of money to particular companies because of all kinds of problems about distribution and equity and problems of verification that you're actually getting something for that money. But somehow the shiny object of, oh, if you give this money, we'll do such and such, attracts people every time. This, to me, this is like being healthy. You know, if you're going to be healthy, you have to eat right and exercise and get your sleep. There's no shortcut. You got to do the basics. So if you want a healthy economy, you have to do the basics. And you can't just do it for part of the state, you have to do it for the whole state. And to me, your report is really, it's debunking some of the myths, the shiny objects, but to me, you're really pointing at those basics. And I think that's a very useful, it's very useful what you've done here. Thank you. Uh, doing the basics doesn't lead to ribbon cuttings quite as often as the other stuff and, does. Though. But it works, <laughs> but it's work. What do you want? You want ribbon cuttings or you want something that works? Elected officials often. No, like your ribbon. I know, but I'm an economist, so I want something that works. I agree. <laughs> well, we don't have any ribbons in Calus, so. Okay. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Can I ask you just to repeat um, the colorful name you used for? The marginally attached. No, 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 no. Oh, something about shiny shoes. Shiny shoe crowd. Oh, I think he kind of mumbled his way through that. Thanks so much for hearing and repeating that. I meant the lobbyists, not you. Yeah. We have salt all over our <laughs> Do you give the same presentation across the hall to? I did this year. I was there on Tuesday. Okay. That's interesting. There's a whole bunch of new people over there. Yeah, yeah that's a new people. Good. Yeah. So, who knows? But my point about it was the pivoting. Yeah. You know, you're going to have to take money from something that's going to upset someone. And there's not likely to be any new money or any substantial amounts of new money. So it requires a lot of courage. Yeah. Well, it, it, you know, and there's this yeah. tradition of getting an economic development bill, which typically originates both House and Senate, and everybody's good idea and everybody's worst idea all ends up in it, um, and it ends up in here. And, you know, there's always been some tension between this committee, which has to actually come up with the money uh, effectively, and, um, and the economic development folks. And, it, it, it's a, if it's a pivot, it's a very slow pivot. It's not going to happen quickly. You know, as a practical matter, um, you, you benefit from close contact with and uh, access to the resources of JFO. Yeah. The Economic Development Committees do not. Uh, yeah. It's rare, but yeah, on occasion, no, on occasion, they will ask for a fiscal note sure. from the top right. for that. Right. And yeah. that is so valuable. Now, it depends typically on whether there's a whole bunch of new programs being proposed or not. If it's just a continuation, then most likely Steve wouldn't <coughs> spend yeah, money. Yeah, and I'm not being critical. They have, a lot of, they, they have the tools they have. Yeah. And I, I happen to think that this um, bidding war, as I was calling it, but really the competition between the states, is um, more significant. I, I don't think it's as easy to dismiss as you as you. I wasn't dismissing the fact that people believe it, yeah. only that I don't think it's real. Uh, there, there's a whole industry if of all, businesses if every, that... all the states sat down and said, we're not going to do this anymore, it, it, the world would look very much the way it looks right now, but you've got to get everybody to, oh, yeah. to join in. But what I'm saying is, there's no risk for us unilaterally disarming, because it is almost meaningless in terms of job creation in this state. And we can't compete anymore. We're not competing. No. We can't compete. So we might as well compete based on our assets and our strengths and the people that want to be here, the people that are already here. Right. Rather than bribing people to come, because if you bribe someone to come, as soon as they get a better bribe, they'll leave. Yeah. And furthermore, this this I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna, there's a great uh, podcast I listened to recently on, on the uh, 
four billion dollars that Wisconsin gave Foxconn, and it really like con is in the name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Good one. Appropriate. Good one. <laughs> Good one. Good one. In, in addition to the basics as you described, we know what people want. They want good quality of life. They want good education for their kids. Mm -hmm. And you and your colleagues have spent, as far as I know, ever since I've been here, 30 years talking about how to pay for education and how much. If, if you all, collectively, all three parties and independents said, we're going to get together and commit to making our public schools the best in the country, and not by a little, but by a lot, and we're going to have a 20-year commitment to this, and we mean it, they'd be lining up at the border. We, we shouldn't have to bribe people or market Vermont. We should do what we know they want and need. I just don't see that happening. It makes me sad. As our tweeter in chief would say, sad. Sad. <laughs> <laughs> Poor me. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Other questions for that? There are other things that you want to cover that you have It's all good. To? Appreciate the time, though. Yeah. We are back on budget adjustment, and we are going to be talking about the health care resources trust fund. No, I'm sorry, the, the employer assessment, the employer assessment, right? That's what you do. Oh, great. Uh, for the record, Noel Langwell, the Joint Fiscal Office. I uh, see we have some new people on the committee. Thank you for acknowledging that, because I've had to remind everybody else, so I appreciate that. I will stay away from acronyms. Um, but also Ooh. back to the question, um, well, I can do it high level. Um, what the what the employer assessment is without getting into too much detail. So the, the employer assessment is a assessment tax, whatever you want to call it, on employers. Um, it's basically there's so um, so employer there's categories of of when an employer has to pay this employer assessment. It's for employers who have employees who do not offer to pay any part of their health insurance, uh, or they're not eligible for their health insurance, or an employee is eligible for the coverage but elects not to go on the insurance, or their employees on Medicaid. And it's a way for the state to sort of uh, capture some money uh, to help pay for Medicaid for employers who don't offer, uh, or, or for various reasons why people uh, may not have health insurance. That money is deposited into the state health care resources. And employers of a uh, small number of employees are exempt, right? Yeah, it's actually measured on FTEs. There's a whole formula, there's a worksheet that employees, employers have to fill out on how to calculate what an FTE is based on hours and other stuff. The first four FTEs are exclusive. <coughs> and then after that, um, you pay the assessment. What I have up there is uh, just a historical how much, it's paid quarterly. Um, and when it first passed in uh, 2007, I believe, by an act, part of Act 191, it was assessed as a dollar a day, or $365 a year, or $91.50 per quarter. That's how it was initially done. And then what had happened was each year it's indexed. The under, it was it was done during Catamount Health, and it was used to help pay for Catamount Health. And how it was indexed was if Catamount Health went up by 5% the premium the employer assessment increased at 5%. So it was tied to, it was indexed to the increase in the underlying premium. When Catamount went away, and we did exchanges as part of the Affordable Care Act, we moved the what it's uh, indexed to, to the second lowest silver plan in the exchange. The second lowest silver plan, people go, why the second lowest silver plan? That's how the federal government um, ties their federal subsidy to, and so we tie the state subsidy to. So it's just sort of a benchmark that the feds use, so we've been using it as a benchmark. You'll see here, these are the quarterly assessments in 2016, it was 151.12 per FTE per quarter, um, and it raised 18 million. Uh, 2017, it went to 158.63, 2018, it went to 163.20. Last year, we did this, now I'm gonna, that we've got this box, you know, last year we did this thing, uh, it was a, uh, many people were here remember, we did this, it's, it's termed silver loading. And what happened is the federal government, under the Affordable Care Act, there's this thing called, called cost sharing reductions, and it's to help people up to 400%, actually up to 250% of federal poverty with their cost sharing on, if they're on the exchange in the individual market, uh, it helps them, it basically lowers the actuarial value, which basically reduces their out-of-pocket exposure. 
the Affordable Care Act required these subsidies, and as a, but what they did was the federal government reimbursed the insurance companies to do the subsidy. And by executive order last year, the, the federal administration said, we're no longer going to be funding these cost-sharing reduction programs. But by federal law, the insurers were still required to do these. So in other words, the insurance companies had to absorb the cost. So what happens when the insurance companies absorb the cost? They press and pass it on in the form of increased premiums. So what a lot of states start doing is there's also this thing called the advanced premium tax credit. And what it is is it, it limits, if you're up to 400% of federal poverty, it limits how much your premium you'd have to pay. It's basically a premium subsidy. And that's tied to the second lowest silver plan. That's how you, the subsidy is calculated. Um, so what, we, what, what a lot of states started doing is, they, instead of taking that 3, let's say it was a 3%, I believe it was a 3% or, I don't remember what it was, but instead of spreading the premium increase across all the plans in exchange, which would include small businesses, people who don't get subsidies, et cetera, states started doing this thing called silver loading, where they would take that all the premium increase and tie it and push it into the second lowest silver plan so that the federal government would actually want to pick up the increased cost of the premium through the advanced premium tax credit. So in other words, the federal government took away the funding, the states came up with a mechanism to just to make the federal government still pick up all the costs. So when we did that, we decided to, so the state of Vermont allowed for silver loading as well. What we did not realize when we did this law is that we're tying it to the second lowest cost plan in the exchange. In the language in the in budget adjustment, you'll see it says inside and outside the exchange. It's changing it. Right now, it's tied to the second lowest solar plant in the exchange. Well, the second lowest solar plant in the exchange is the silver loaded plant, which means that the premium <laughs> will now jump 23%. <laughs> Sorry, which means that the underlying assessment will jump 23%, and which would create an additional $945,000 that employers would pay for this is just one quarter in 2018, in 2019, gets only one quarter of collection in 2019, then annualized it's $4 million more. So this was something that, oops, we didn't realize, we didn't anticipate it. So what the budget adjustment language does is it says, it just adds the word and outside the exchange, so it ties it to the second lowest silver plan, and the second lowest silver plan outside the exchange would just be 3%. I'm not sure what the grammar is, but what does it mean to say we're tying it to the second lowest plan inside and outside? How does that work? So it has the plans that are outside the exchange to the menu of plans you can tie it to. So what, they, what we did as part of the silver loading is it used to be the, the individual plans you could only used to be able to buy them on the exchange. And so now what was done was they created this sort of outside the exchange so people who do not have of subsidies can buy a plan that is not silver loaded outside the exchange that only saw a three percent premium increase. So if you didn't have a premium subsidy and you're buying on the exchange, you're not forced to buy the plan with a twenty three percent. You can buy the plan that only went by three percent. It's outside. It's outside the exchange. So we also allowed you to buy it outside the exchange. Still buying it through the insurers. I, I just don't understand how you can have a, a marker that's in two different places. Which which one is it? I, I get that. I get the outside the exchange thing. It's the grammar of it that I'm having trouble with. I, I I I completely understand what you said. What you're saying, and I thought about that too. Inside versus outside this imaginary wall. Um, why don't we? I mean, if it's inside and outside, why don't we just stop at um, the second lowest plan? Period. You could do that too. And then we don't have this question about which we're choosing. It just seems weird to me to say we're pegging it to the lowest plan, second lowest plan, inside and outside, if they're different, um, yeah. then how do you know which one you're going to go to? Yeah. Uh, purely, purely grammar, not yeah, and, yeah. what you're doing. And Jen, do you understand believe, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I do. I, I believe Jed Carby was also involved in the language of that, um, so I would recommend talking to her about the linguistics. I completely understand her point. I would just <clears throat> caution, I guess. I understand the gaming part of the phrase. Okay. To get the uh, 
uh, premium increase for those uncovered down to 3%. Clear about that. I thought, however, that once you asked insurers to essentially offer those plans, the benefit to the uh, subscriber deteriorates in the sense that some of those plans begin not to look like uh, ones that the Affordable Care Act was uh, approving of. That is to say, they either had high deductibles or large copays or whatever. Yeah. And I worry that state policy is following an unfortunate unraveling, if you will, of a good quality plan. I understand the premium issue. No, your point is well taken, and I think there's still um, there's still like um, regulations about what the outside of the exchange plan would look like in order to be considered a silver plan. Okay. And if I remember, the way the only difference between the inside of the exchange and the outside of the exchange plan had to do with like a copay for uh, ambulance services. So it was like some it was a very small benefit that not a lot of people use, and it was like maybe increasing the copay. I don't remember exactly what it was. But the difference between those two plans is very minimal. If, if I may interrupt, what the gentleman just said says to me that we would be uh, wise to reconsidering, reconsider jettisoning the word silver. So, so, the, so let me just get us back to what we're talking about here. Good. What we're talking Round about here sorry. is what, how we're going to de decide what percentage increase there is in the employer assessment. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to do with the validity of these plans Correct. at all. Um, yep. And so we're trying to pick the right um, mm -hmm. um, uh, anchor, anchor. Okay. <laughs> or whatever, accelerator. Um, and um, I, I guess I think what you've done is weird um, because it's heading to two different things. Um, whole different question about whether you know what you want it pegged to. What do you want it pegged to? Plans outside the exchange? Yeah, it was basically, it was just, it, it, they, the intent is for it not to be tagged, pegged to the silver loaded plan. So, like I said, I looked at what the second lowest cost silver plan is. Um, I mean, we're getting to whether it's, you know, I think the whole idea between using the words on the exchange or outside the exchange yeah. really just has to do with making sure that the tax department is clear on what Well, everybody what it is. needs to be clear, because yeah. this may seem really clear to us while we're talking, but Our three job. years down the road, we're going to look at it and think we're going to talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I can mm -hmm. talk to Jen about, like, yeah. how do we, I, I completely understand the question. Yeah. I could talk to her I, about. I think we're good with finding a different um, yeah. uh, anchor. Uh, anchor. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> I, uh, I just want to be sure that we know what the anchor is and mm -hmm. that it's going to last. I understand. <laughs> I'll work with Jen on, on clarifying. Yeah. Cool. And, and that, uh, the health care committee may want to weigh in on it because they know a whole lot more about it than we do. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But it, it is our decision about whether we want to dial back on that revenue. And I get the feeling everyone says, yes, we didn't plan to have a $4 million increase. So um, we, should, we should do what we can not to have it. Um, but I think we want to be sure that we're not re revisiting this next year. Is that fair? Any other questions anyone has about it? The only other thing I would add to this is that um, Jen has, is working with Maria to come up with some language about um, about it, uh, implementation date. She just she came up with some wording uh, to make it clear okay. about when it, 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 when it triggers. Yeah, because yeah. she just added language that's very specific, so that it's very clear that there's no ambiguity for the tax department when they were implemented. So she just has some suggestions on that. Right, and I got moved to tax. I forgot about that. Was like, yeah. Tax. So that's the only thing I like to look. Yeah. Well, it's, it's okay. Agreed. The, the faster we can advise employers to wait, because we're going to enact this by the time the first quarter of this year's bill well, goes if, out. If it passes one house, that would be a really good indicator. It's hard to know when budget adjustment's going to pass. But a, the budget the schedule that I understand for budget adjustment is the committee is hoping to vote next week sometime, um, which is why we're it's April 1, right? So, it, yeah, so um, it takes effect January 1, but the collection wouldn't be, I think the collection date's like April 15th or April 30th. And the tax department, as far as I know, they sent out their, they had to send out their first notice, which said, it's by law, it's this, but the legislature and the governor are working on it. Stay tuned. Mm -hmm. So that's what they told the players. So you'll be back. Be back, and I'll work with Jen. Cool. Okay. Uh, good. good. All right, um, uh, we are now on uh, Steve. Uh, are you going to be next? Yes. 
<laughs> okay, so um, uh, this afternoon, the episode of discussion is continuing on the budget adjustment is on this movement of the healthcare resources fund, most of it back into the general fund, and that's sort of what we're talking about. So proposals in the budget adjustment. And so that's what I thought, you know, actually we have a lot of people here to present on that. So uh, what I'm going to do is start off with a context-y type thing, and then we're going to turn it over to Stephanie, who's going to do a balance sheet, and then, as I understand it, um, the commissioner and deputy commissioner may comment on this. And so the first sheet I'm going to point you to is this one. This was in the budget uh, that we that we did last May. It had two provisions. One is the first one, D108, which says that they may include the governor's proposal, a recommendation, draft language, is to transfer the revenues and expenditures to make up the health care resource fund of the general fund by the close of 2019. And that's what we're talking about is this proposal. The second language, D109, really brought a second piece of that in there, which is, and you, we already talked this morning about the education fund, is to look at the reserve implications of the moving of the $300 million out of the general fund. And so those are the two um, language pieces that were really... The, and started. we don't have those. The, but these the, are in the budget bill. These are the what passed in May. Oh, these are the old, this is the old budget This bill. is currently what, yeah. what was in law. All right. And so this is the context for the yeah. action that you're seeing in the budget adjustment. And so well, the next chart on the bottom of that page, just to give you a flavor of why we were all thinking about that last May, is uh, the general fund total, if there had been no education fund restructure, would have been at 5% with a spending of 1595. The general fund current law, post the education fund restructure, um, we, le we left the 78, 180 in there. But given that the general fund is now down to 1294, it's actually at six percent, which is, and so there are that that raises the question. We need to look at the, the whole question about reserves because um, one possibility would have been to just reduce that down to five percent and give that money back. You know, another possibility would be to raise the stabilization to six percent. It was an issue. Safe Health Care Resources Fund has no reserve, uh, two hundred ninety-one million dollars without a reserve, and if you move the Health Care Resources Fund back in to make up for the taking out of the education fund, we get back to about a 5% reserve. So that's sort of the sum of the concept of the moving pieces that are being talked about here. So what are the downsides of moving it? Well, um, I think there's only upsides. But there are some concerns, and they came up in the discussion. And I'll, one of them was the uh, agency of human services wanted to make sure, because some of these revenues that we're talking about are revenues like provider tax and claims, and they wanted to make sure that they they still were kept in a um, a world that you know that was healthcare. And so what happened was when the administration gave you their proposal in, in the bill, you'll see some language saying the accounting has to be done like it was before. So it'll be in the general fund. But it'll be in a separate area. Of it. it'll, it'll be separated out and kept in tracking in a way that that does preserve that sort of. Piece. And that was something the AHS could, could call the okay about. So basically the concern was we don't want to lose the fact that these were raised for a particular purpose. Um, one could say, no, we want to cap separately because we want it for a bigger purpose. But I think after discussing with the AHS, this concept of keeping it inside the general fund but accounting for it separately was um, acceptable to them. It's sort of it's a balance. That's one, that was the only downside that came up in the fifth, and I know about it. Uh, I think that uh, 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 Matt Riven and uh, you know the others can, Adam can bring up other downsides if they can think of them. And, and the upside. Now the upside is really <clears throat> important. And I, there's another document I want to just, I'm to back up. I, if we could put on the one that is the bond rating issue. And okay. one of the things about our stabilization structure, and I'd like to, at some point, we'll talk about reserves. But Vermont has a, a multitude, has a number of reserves. We have a, a stabilization reserve, which is what we're talking about now, is the primary sort of reserve. It's a cash flow reserve, and it's 5% of the prior year general fund spending. Um, then we have rainy day funds and other reserves. So uh, one of the things 
that happened this summer or this fall, and you probably all remember this or you know about it. We had Moody's downgrade us in bond rating. And the, the reason I bring it up is uh, our general fund, with this change the way it is now, we just double checked it, is the, and partially we're a small state, but, but also it is the smallest general fund in the country. When we, if we were to add this back in there, we'll be number two, because Wyoming is, that'll get us about Wyoming. It's, it's a fairly small general fund, but, um, <laughs> but, um, but the point is that, you know, part of it is this is the fund that's supposed to cover general expenses. And so when it's one that sort of Wall Street, stands out to Wall Street, as does this reserve, the stabilization reserve for the general fund. If, it, you know, we're, we've had sort of a, a bad year on bond ratings. If we start pulling 13 million out of this, even if we can justify it because the general fund's gotten smaller, it's it's not a good optic, basically. So part of it is um, the optic of um, uh, keeping the general fund stabilization reserve at roughly at the same level. The second thing is, currently there is no reserve for the healthcare resources fund. And what happens is when the healthcare resources fund doesn't have enough money, the general fund picks up the bill. And it, it's a direct, it's yeah. the most direct, uh, uh, it, it's really not in itself a, a fund with any value. And, and uh, it's just a way to, it's a money flow. And so to us, it seems like the correct thing to do is be to merge it in. I mean, the alternative would have been to maybe create its own reserve, move that five million into the healthcare resource fund, keep it separate, have a reserve. But, but invariably what happens is literally every year, every budget adjustment, the, the impacts are direct on the general fund. And you're going to see that in the in the budget. And you'll see it again. And we've had years in here where we've needed to raise money that's basically need, needed yeah. to cover Medicaid, but we've done it with non-Medicaid kind right. of money and shifted money around, or the other way around. You know, we've had to cover shortfalls yeah. in the general fund. I don't remember which way it usually goes, but we treat those funds as though there's no real wall between right. them anyway. And, and just, you know, maybe a um, concern would have been, and I'm going to throw this out, and this is going into the speculative land, but a number of years ago, there was a, a pretty strong movement towards single payer in the, in the state. And at that time, there would be an argument, let's create a health care, you know, let's start sit balkanizing health care, put it over here, create a fund. It's not the environment we're living in right now. And it's... it's well, it's, actually started with Canada. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so I, I just think, yeah. from a management point of view, and, and part of the problem you have to realize, as a budget person, I, I know this is a terrible thing and you hate it. I would like all funds to be in one big puddle, but they're not. You know, this one, this one is one that is the most, um, I would say, easy to do. It helps to counteract what we did with the 300 million, and it will keep our reserves relatively flat. So uh, that would be the end of what I would start off with. And I, 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 I wanted to go into this because this is sort of take a hold of this and this. If you switch down. Let me see if there's questions in the first yeah. uh, Did you have one, yeah. yeah, I guess it, it actually might be a better question for Nolan. But you know, there is a, a bit of a push now not to single payer, but to universal primary care mm -hmm. funded you know, out of the state fund. How, does that play into this one way or the other at all? Well, I'll give you my answer, and no one can comment. If you develop a new proposal to do universal anything, you're going to have to figure out a whole new financial system. And so I would recommend you build the world to, to the fiscal line we're thinking of now, and then if that, if that does happen, if you set up a new system, think about it, because then you'll have transition costs, all the things you'll... Uh, I think keeping something that is probably not fiscally logical in place, just in the off chance you do that. Oh, I say, even in, even if you, then I can't. I don't want to speak for the people supporting that. Maybe it'll pass, but I think it's something you should do in the context of that bill. But I don't want to know. I agree. Okay. Let me just flag one thing in this document. Yeah. Um, this is what the Moody's told us about uh, their downgrade, and you know they mm -hmm. talked about. Uh, this is on page two. And it says, factors that lead to an upgrade, improve demographics, economic trends, um, attract the nation. Well, that's a tough one. We're working on that, getting more people to move to Vermont. Uh, moderated leverage, especially unfunded pensions, retiree health care obligations relative to the state GDP. And that's one we talked about a little bit this morning. It's obviously in the top of the legislature and the administration's radar screen to deal with the pension unfunded liability. Factors that can lead to a downgrade and sustained growth in debt or unfunded post-employment. 
why the lease the act, and that's what we mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about that this morning yeah. um, a slowdown in the economic development of revenue growth and the last thing I just want to really flag is a departure from the strong fiscal management practices one thing Vermont has always sold itself on is we are um, I would say given that we're a small size we're a fairly nimble state in fiscal issues and this is an example of a uh, another part of that adjustment, this cleans up our, our fiscal situation and seems to make sense from a, um, and I think we'll be able to tell Wall Street, we did not want that reserve to fall, we, we moved concentrated funds, we, in the process, we have taken something that has no reserve and moved it in the way it does, and so I view this as sort of, if anything, a good story for the Wall Street world. Do you know why our general fund is so small? Um, I realize that we're small, but, yeah. um, but we, you know, you need a certain amount of government, no matter what size you are. Do we have more special funds? Yes, in other we are. We yes. are way up there in special yes. funds. Yes, and there's. That, that's Tom Cavett told me he'd never seen a state with more special funds and dedicated revenue for this and dedicated. The most states just put it all in big five, big pot, and fight about it. Right, but people like to have the fights when they have their own special fund. So I thought what I'd do now, and we could do this, is um, have. Stephanie, take a couple minutes and go to the balance sheet piece of this, and then, then turn it over to the administration who can. Sure. And, and we can actually go over the direct language. The way you're involved is every time we say this revenue shall move to the general fund, right. we're taking it as a tax, and we're saying the tax now gets paid to the general fund rather than that right. healthcare research fund. So right. it's just on the fact that we're, we're touching tax law, it, it, yeah. you guys it's, get. It's really more yeah. Yeah. It's a redirection. Yeah. Okay. But it's nice to know about it. Yeah. balance sheet, which is one of my sheets with lots of numbers on it. Um, the other, uh, just to echo what Steve said, um, I was asked in the uh, committee upstairs yesterday, or the day before, I can't remember now, <laughs> or any, but um, whether or not I felt like there was any risk about doing that. And um, because it's moving from a fund that currently has, is, is part of the forecast in July and January to the general fund, which is it has an emergency board forecast process <laughs> around it. That's a very powerful process. Um, and to me, it's the, it, we, we as a staff group do the state health care resource fund. It'll move into the, the whole general fund picture that the economists yeah, put before that's, you. That's actually a great point. So sure. that's, to me, it's, and, it, and it's intended to have a very transparent subtotaling of the health care taxes within that fund. Um, and so that, to me, is it's just what piece of paper does it show up on? The one called general fund or the one called, but the, all the processes around it stay the same. So, um, so um, general fund balance sheet is, uh, or operating statements, not really balance sheet, <laughs> um, is, this gives a, a couple years of information. Column A, um, top side of the sheet, rows 1 through 13 are the revenue into the general fund. Um, the, the middle section, uh, rows 14 through 23, are the spending, um, and then below the operating position of the fund are the transfers in and out um, of the fund. But column A is, is FY18, that's a closed year, that closed at the end of June, and that's the picture of the general fund um, as it was when it ended in June. And you can see, if we just go across, we'll just, we'll take line one, um, uh, 1.55 billion dollars and then you see in the grayed out column column B same line one um, that was where we were in May at 15 point uh, 1.568 billion dollars but go to the next two lines below and you see two negative numbers you see nearly a 30 million dollar number that was the personal income tax changes that you made last year, and then the negative $300 million, which was the restructuring of the Ed Fund with the dedication yeah. of the full um, sales and use tax to the Ed Fund. And so when you go over to the next column in July, when we updated the revenue on line one, you see that 
substantial drop to $1.27 billion. And so that was in terms of shrinking the size. <laughs> um, and so um, when you come over to, to column D, which is the column for last uh, Friday when the administration put its housekeeping budget adjustment on the table, um, the next line down, you see the 272.67. That would be the change of the revenue coming into the general fund within the budget adjustment in FY19. And so you bring that that um, total revenue in the fund um, back up closer to 1. Um, 1.6 billion, little 1.57. So that's um, where how you see it on this on the revenue side. And then if you go down, all the yellow pieces are the pieces of change that are within the budget adjustment. Um, but if you go down to line 22 in line D, you see the exact same amount as additional spending in the general fund because you've moved the revenue over. So if you were looking concurrently at a state health care resource sheet, that would be a negative on the spending side in the state health care resource, just the same way that the revenue would be negative. Um, and so that just gives you the clear picture of, of how that change would happen over time. Um, the only other two things I'd point out on this sheet, if you come all the way down to the bottom, um, you get the picture of the full reserves, the stabilization reserve, which is based on 5% of prior year appropriations. So it's going to always be based on uh, the prior year's total on line 23 of this sheet. Um, and that's what Steve just walked through on the um, in the previous presentation. But you see we also have a rainy day fund, human service caseload reserve fund, and then we have um, our dedicated 27 and 53 reserves, which are, have very specific purposes to them. But the, we, unlike other states, and that we have lots of reserve funds, too? Some people find it confounding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and, and we have, I mean, it's been a tremendous yeah. amount of progress in the very yeah. recent past to, to you yeah. know, part of it is the, yeah. The luck we had of you know building up the global yeah. commitment fund and being able to, to sweep it into the general fund, um, but there is a stabilization reserve fund in the Ed Fund, which this committee is well aware of, and there is a stabilization reserve fund in the transportation fund, yeah. which is equal in size to the state healthcare resource fund currently. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> and I've been a, probably a harper in front of the keyboard a little bit about not having reserve in the state healthcare resource fund. I don't know if there's any questions on this sheet as people yes. look through it. I kind of. Any questions? It's very helpful to hear. Okay. Thank you. Pat, do you want to join us? Sure. I invite my colleague and. There's a chair, you think? Yeah. You want to grab a chair? Where it is. This one's from the hall. Oh, yeah. You get one from the hall near the chamber. That's on the website, yeah. So I have to say, it's nice to see you. Yes, it's great to be here. The room has changed a little bit since I told uh, Nolan when I walked in. I asked him, was it a coincidence that the employer assessment Tax was up on the board when I walked in. Was that purely a coincidence, or were you torturing me even more? Uh, and we're just going to leave that for a minute. Yeah. Anyway, um, Adam Gresham, Commissioner of Finance and Management. Thank you, Madam Chair, for inviting me. Um, so, as always, the uh, Joint Fiscal Office was more than thorough. Um, but I thought I would maybe add one component to the discussion. Um, really more from a, a budgeting standpoint. And so we. this is um, just one section of the big bill. Uh, the 300 section is typically for human services, and B301 is the global commitment section. And the reason I put it there is to illustrate kind of where the Healthcare Resources Fund sits relative to other funds within our global commitment uh, section. But if you look, you know, you can see how much we put in, but if you look at the source of funds, you notice there's quite a few other funds there. And, you know, there's this sense that, well, there's this truth that 
the money that we put into the health care resources fund goes to pay for Medicaid, but it's not, the illustration here will tell you, it's not nearly all that we put towards Medicaid. We put quite a bit more money in there. And the way, and I think Steve alluded to this earlier, if, for example, if Representative Till gets his way and everyone in Vermont gives up smoking and our tobacco revenue goes down, then the source of funds general fund will go up. So we've looked at it in that way. And um, I think it's important to realize that just because we're merging the funds together doesn't mean we're going to think about in terms of our allocation to the global commitment to Medicaid any differently. Um, it's going to be the same. Um, and the general fund has always, in my um, vast career in budgeting, has always been the backstop for um, the healthcare resources fund when it runs shy. So I, I just think it's important to note that. I mean, we consider it as one component to a much larger commitment to um, healthcare. So if we did this special accounting that we're talking about, what would this look like? Would this, would this just would have a larger general fund figure? Yeah. The healthcare resources and, fund would disappear. And, and, um, and somewhere in the back of the book, that most of us would look at, it would be clear that this was money from tobacco or from right. one of the one of what the provider tax or something rather. Is that is that the right. way we're thinking about it? And you know, admittedly, trying to be balanced. I mean, I think someone asked, why wouldn't we do this? And you know, the only thing I can think of is, you know, some people think it's nice to know that, for example, when you pay a tobacco tax, that that's going directly to healthcare. You know, and that's right. perfectly traceable. Yeah. Um, so yes, it's true, we lose that, tr although. But it's still know. going to be in a special account, but it's right. still going to go for health care. And if we need to raise money for health care, we're likely to look at some of the usual places we look, which would be tobacco tax, for example. Exactly right. Yeah. So. Um, other questions? So um, where did the money for tobacco cessation programs come from? Are they coming out of the state health care? I don't think so. The tobacco fund. That would be a tobacco There's a separate fund. tobacco yeah. fund. Yeah. Other than yeah. Sure. Um, just to be clear, we, the, some of the tobacco cessation stuff we do through Medicaid. So it's a combination of tobacco and federal funds and things like that. And then some we do purely as state funds, which would be tobacco funds. So we, do, we, we leverage Medicaid to the greatest extent we can sure. around all um, tobacco cessation and, and um, but the you know, origin uh, of it all is uh, the origin of the state funds is all tobacco funds. Yes. So, uh, can we have questions for Adam? Anyone else? Jim. Nice, nice to see you. Nice, <laughs> nice, nice to have you back. Yeah, nice to have you back. Um, anyone else? Got anything? I think I'll feeling um, okay about doing this. Yep. We have to have reservations right. about it. I'm sure about um, yeah. my. Just a, a couple technical things from sure. the sorry, Matt Graven, Deputy yeah. Finance Commissioner. Just a couple of technical things from the uh, budgeting and accounting side. Um, we already do have account codes for each of the fund sources that Stephanie mentioned. So we don't have to create anything new. We already know exactly uh, where those, uh, where the provider taxes, not just total provider taxes, but by category of provider tax. So we have that all that detail already, and we will preserve it. Um, one thing to, to emphasize on Adam's slide is that that is the only appropriation where state health care resources funds are used. It is entirely used in the Medicaid um, to, to provide as a fund source to Medicaid, there is no, there are no other appropriations of state healthcare resource uh, fund. Um, and, and as Adam mentioned, in addition to the two hundred eighty-three million dollars of general fund that we put in, which we adjust depending on the estimate of the state. And the last piece, the technical piece, is that there will still be a small portion of the state healthcare resources fund related to member premiums. And that would be more typical of a special fund where if, if a program involves collecting uh, premium, you know, participation from the people in the program, then oftentimes that's a circumstance where we would use a special fund to make sure that those collections from the individual participating would be isolated in a special fund. So there'll be about 
15, 16 million maybe. So, you, so we still have the special fund that's just got a different name and a different purpose. Same name, it'll be same much, name. much smaller. So it'll be, I think, in the neighborhood of $16 million for State Health Care Resources Fund, and all the rest of it will be in the general fund. And that is reflected in our in our BAA. So I have a question. When, uh, um, you know, for whatever reason, maybe it's maybe it's um, universal fund America, there's, there's some need for us to raise money for health care. And we often start with, well, what are we doing now? Um, you know, we want to have a sheet that shows all the sources of revenue and how much money is coming in that's dedicated to health care or that's allocated to health care. Um, are we still going to be able to get that? Um, is this this change going to make it more difficult to get that information? No. So um, if, it, if it goes into the general fund, as, as we're jointly proposing, it will still have that accounting detail from where the the source of from what is coming, and then if you moved it back out, we would in all likelihood use the same account code, just credit it to a different special fund. Or, or what's more likely to happen is tobacco sales go down, and so we're running short on one of our sources of revenue, and then we want to understand exactly what money is coming in from sources that we had identified as healthcare. Um, <laughs> yeah, they just, just want to be sure. That Ab we're absolutely, not and, and, and the economists do that now with the general okay. fund, where okay. when they're looking at total general fund performance, they're isolating <laughs> out the pieces that are up and the pieces that are down. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's an obvious question, but was the reason for creating the special fund in the first place is because it had a dedicated use? It was for cap. No, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. All right. Uh, that was yeah. intended yeah. to grow into more of a yeah. single payer light yeah. rather than light okay. uh, program. Right. And Makes um, good sense. ACA came in and undid it. So it, I think it yeah. was really. I think it made sense when we did it. Um, but I agree, it's outgrown its um, purpose. Well, your answer and, and Stephanie's answer on. Uh, I can't remember what your words were, Stephanie, but the, the, the account codes being the same. That's and, helpful. Yeah. and the transparency stuff being sort of. Having a subtotal that you can Yeah, yeah. Very helpful. Thank you.